right to public participation because many of you already have um, forms in and, and Aaron Schneider is going to um, describe for you the format for this. We, we do have several forms for public participation. I will call you to the table and I will try to remember to let you know who's next to speak so that you can begin to prepare. When I call you to the table, you can come sit right at the end. If you have handouts, you can pass them to your right and left. We'll get those to board members around the table. You'll have three minutes to speak, and the board, as a matter of practice, does not engage in discussion at this time. So our first speaker is Kathleen Ader, and the second person is Chris Jurians. So Kathleen, if you could please come to the table. Okay, is Kathleen here? Yeah. I'm going to put Chris further back then, and Ann Foote would be the next speaker. Hi there. My name is Kathleen Ader. I'm here on uh, behalf of Novi School District, but also the Network of Michigan Educators. Um, I would like to thank those of you that attended the forum. I didn't know that. Um, so as a member of the Network of Michigan Educators, we're just here to try to share um, some successes that are occurring in our classroom. So I'm here to tell you a little bit today about um, data collection and how we are using um, data collection in the classroom. Um, so in, I teach chemistry, regular chemistry and IB chemistry at Novi High School. And I, um, with my chemistry PLC, we have been using um, different data collection tools to analyze our common assessments across teachers. And some of the tools we use might be a uh, Scantron item analysis sheet or even um, Smart Response has little clickers or remote control um, input devices. So when we use those, we can then get a spreadsheet that will analyze not only for our students immediately which questions they got correct, which ones they got wrong, but then as teachers we can look and see you know, did 40% of the students miss this particular question? Did, you know, 70% miss the question? But in addition to that, we can also see which questions or which answer options are they selecting. So we can kind of, you know, drill down and get inside their brains and understand where their misconceptions um, may lie. Some of the very powerful things we've been doing that I present here on this sheet, um, comparing two different teachers and seeing where there are discrepancies between how their students are performing on any given assessment. Um, and in our PLC, PLC, we take anything that's a double-digit number and decide that we want to look a little more closely at that particular question. And so we've found times where um, perhaps one teacher is, is performing a lab or some type of project <laughs> that's really helping students um, understand this concept and this standard, and so then perhaps that's something that the entire PLC should explore um, adding to their classroom. Um, Novi is also a focused school district, um, so we have been looking at how our students are performing across gender um, and different ethnic groups as well. And so we, in our PLC, have, have analyzed our data from our first semester chemistry final and looking at, um, you know, how are different students performing and then what might be um, the things that are happening in some classrooms that aren't happening in others to try to help all the students succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thanks for representing teachers so well. Ann Foote is our next speaker, followed by Isabel Terry. <coughs> is Ann Foote here? Isabel also left. Okay. How about uh, is Chris Jurians? Is it just right here? Chris? You're up. No, let, let me, I'll come back to you. I don't want to make you. Melanie Curtis. How about that? I'm here. And following Melanie will be Tony Hall and Tony Cyber. Uh, I wanted to thank all the folks that came this morning, and I want to um, thank the board for deciding to delay the vote on the next generation standards to give some due consideration and more information. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board and the Department of Ed. Many of you may recognize me as someone who's attended your meetings and followed your work and actually attempted to become part of your team last year. Best wishes to those of you who beat me. <laughs> I come before you today to ask you to stop the implementation of Common Core Standards and Assessments and that you vote not to accept the next generation <coughs> science standards. Most of you have been working hard on improving education for many years. 
Sadly, our collective efforts have not generated very good results. 40% of our students can't read at grade level, and 70% of our students can't work at math at grade level. Ed Trust Midwest recently published a report indicating we are among the worst states in the rate of improvement. Perhaps we need to be reflective of these results. In this age of accountability, clearly someone has to be held responsible for the collective results of our state. But I'm not here to point fingers. I'm here to offer a constructive suggestion. Over the last 10 years, you specifically, you folks have worked, worked very hard to develop good math and ELA standards. Are they perfect? No. But we have control and we can improve them. We have excellent and fairly straightforward recommendations from the Fordham Institute to guide us. You have worked very hard to establish a good state test with rigorous cut scores that really do reflect student achievement year to year. You know how long this took. You know how hard it was to get here. You have devised credible tests with accommodations. Do these tests work to inform instruction? No, but then they were never intended to do so and we all know that. Tests for this purpose are available on the open market and we can facilitate their use, but the MEEP is a fair measure of student achievement across the state. And now you seem ready to throw in the towel and chuck all this good work for unproven set of standards, an unwritten assessment with no credibility, undefined cut scores, and potential technological disasters. As Eileen Weiser recently said, the Common Core standards are not per perfect, but we cannot fix them. The Smarter Balance assessments are generating crying kids, frustrated parents, and panicking teachers, all afraid that this experiment will cost them dearly in accountability. We cannot fix Smarter Balance. Who is accountable for this leap of faith? All of us in this room know that changing our standards and assessments are not going to improve student achievement. We're spinning our wheels on this agenda. We do need to improve teacher preparation, professional development, and parent engagement, and these are the steps for Michigan to get real improvement in student achievement. You know this is true. We need to retain control, incorporate real best practices like Ma uh, Massachusetts, and manage our destiny. Can you imagine by delegating our sovereign right to direct education that you are delegating accountability? You can't. Can you honestly believe that unnamed, unaccountable bureaucrats care more about Michigan children than you? Our legislators, our own parents and teachers, can you honestly believe this experiment in standards and assessments will be better than what you have been doing all these years? Please reconsider what you're doing. Yes, we must improve student achievement in Michigan, but respect yourselves, your staff, your Michigan legislators, Michigan teachers, and Michigan parents. We know national standards and assessments are not a silver I'm bullet. Sorry, I'm we have sorry work your to time do. Is up. Thank you. Thank you. I just made one copy Are Tony Hall and Tony Cyber here? Yes. Did you want to come to the table together? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Superintendent Flanagan, honored board members, and fellow residents in Michigan. My name is Tony Hall and my partner, Tony Seaborg. We're literacy consultants working in southeastern Michigan. For the past 13 years, we've been working with districts primarily in Wayne and Macomb counties. For six of those years, I was a contract literacy consultant for Wayne Risa. Our principal job has been that of literacy professional development for elementary and middle school, along with the creation of literacy libraries to support teaching strategies that had been implemented. Over these past 13 years, school districts have gone down a path leading them to the Common Core. They have been implementing various research-based strategies that have centered around diagnostic assessment of a child's strengths and needs in literacy and strategies to support the next level of literacy acquisition. The district curriculum directors made these professional development decisions with emphasis on the brightest and best people, researchers from across the country. Many of those have hailed from our state of Michigan. People like Nell Duke and P. David Pearson and Dorsey Hammond and Taffy Raphael and Dick Allington, Lance Gentile, Elaine Weber, just to name a few. They're all a part of it. After many years of working with various groups across the Detroit metropolitan area, I have seen firsthand how they are welcoming the thought 
of the Common Core. They are anxious to align what they have been currently doing with the standards to be able to make the necessary additions so that children during their watch will be better prepared for the future. Many times I've witnessed firsthand the excitement that the teachers have had when they have learned a new strategy, done it with their children, and come back for subsequent professional development and see it working. The Common Core did not begin in the last 10 years. It, rather, in the last two years, it began over the last 10 years. We and they are welcoming the chance to have it all written down so that the necessary scaffolding will continue to occur. I could go on in very specific things like oral language and comprehension and how much they have learned to delve into it and in deeper pieces. But in summation, I've seen how the Common Core has been a path that we have been willfully going down over the last 10 years, taking what's the best in our nation. I view it as a family that has set morals and standards to which they will live and raise their children. Each member of that family has the opportunity to live out and interpret what was set before them, just as school districts could have that same opportunity. They will each put their mark on the world within that family framework. I urge you to support and welcome the opportunities that the Common Core affords us for this next generation of children coming down our way during our watch. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bob Kefkin, followed by Denise Brady. <coughs> Good afternoon, Superintendent Flanagan, board members. My name is Bob Kefchen. I head up government relations for the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. Uh, I'm not going to speak long today, but <clears throat> I did want to make a couple of points. First, uh, what I've distributed to you is a letter signed on to by a host of different organizations from across the state and across different uh, fields. We have organizations on here representing businesses, education, advocacy groups like Education Trust Midwest and Students First, uh, charter schools, parent groups, all signed on to a letter in support of the Common Core State Standards. We applaud the actions of this board in moving forward with implementing the Common Core State Standards for the State of Michigan, and we want to urge you to continue down that pathway. We as principals and the people that have signed on to this letter strongly believe that this is the right path for our state and the right path for our students. Uh, these standards are clear, consistent, rigorous standards, and if we've learned nothing else over the last six years since we implemented the Michigan Merit Curriculum, it is that clear, consistent, and rigorous standards drive results. Our graduation rates are up, our dropout rates are down. Since we implemented the MMC, our uh, ACT scores have continued to climb. These are aligned to what we've done with the Michigan Merit Curriculum, and we would urge you to continue down this path and expand the scope of what we're doing with the MMC into the lower grades. Uh, also from the perspective specifically of principals, and I'm not speaking here on behalf of the group that signed on to this letter, uh, as we move down the road toward greater accountability for our schools, greater accountability for our teachers, it's important that we have in place the right tools to measure teacher growth, student growth, and these standards provide a way of measuring accurately student growth and provide our students and our teachers with a clear, consistent direction on where they're going to go. They're benchmarked and they provide the tools that teachers are going to need to succeed. Uh, they allow us to collaborate with other states, to share resources. Uh, in short, they are providing the kind of backbone that our educators need in order to drive achievement in our schools. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Denise Brady, followed by Michael Yoakum. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I am representing the Michigan Mathematics and Science Center Network. Um, 
as the director of the Capital Area Science and Mathematics Center. And I thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Common Core State Standards. And I just want to share some of the experiences and the growth that I have seen in my work with teachers in professional development settings. Um, these standards are focused at each grade level. They provide the coherence that is needed between the grade levels so that you know, these standards build from kindergarten on through high school and are very intentional and we can work with teachers to recognize and understand those progressions as to how students learn um, to do mathematics and the conceptual knowledge that is built in balance with procedural knowledge. For many years we have assessed procedural knowledge with mathematics and that has not always got us the results. Um, the conceptual understanding is what is very evident in these standards. So as I'm working with teachers and the Mathematics and Science Center networks have had um, large-scale projects around the state, um, especially at the secondary level, um, in the Algebra for All projects, in the Project Prime, which is focused on secondary mathematics, and seeing um, the progressions that teachers now understand. Why is it important in middle school that, teach, that students have this understanding to build through high school? And when the teachers come to professional development and share these things that are going on in their classrooms and the growth that is happening both for them professionally and for their students' knowledge. Um, the other benefit that is inherent with the Common Core State Standards is the plethora of resources that we now have available to us. So in my tenure as a director and as a mathematics um, consultant that we no longer are having to put these resources together ourselves within this state but yet can share with others that are developing resources and have these resources available for our teachers and these great tasks for students to delve into um, in their classrooms and to explore the mathematics. So the Common Core State Standards um, certainly are a benefit to our teachers, to our students, um, our children in this state. And as we look at supporting these um, standards, I urge you to do that um, because they make perfect sense to move our children and education system forward in this state. Thank you very much. <coughs> Our next speaker is Michael Yoakum, followed by Vic Bugni. Sorry if I said that wrong. Good afternoon, <coughs> and thank you for the opportunity to address this important issue today. Um, I'm Michael Yoakum. I'm the Executive Director of Learning Services at Oakland Schools. I'm here today, however, speaking for a group of general education directors from ISDs and regional educational service agencies across the state. <clears throat> I'm not going to read you my written testimony. I just want to make two points. I know that the uh, foresight this board had a few years ago in passing the Common Core State Standards you don't need to hear the arguments in support of them, nor um, any contradictions to the massive amounts of misinformation that is out there. But I want to say this. <clears throat> you heard a wonderful presentation by teachers from Stockbridge this morning. That work can take place under the Common Core and meet many of the mathematics and literacy <coughs> standards that are in the Common Core. Next door, another school district could be taking on work that is very different, very different types but innovative projects, still meeting the targets in the Common Core. We know it's not a federal initiative, but it's also not a curriculum. It's a set of targets for us to work towards. The second thing I want to leave with you is that we've already undertaken work. We're three years down the road in creating materials for teachers they are online at the Michigan Association of Intermediate School District Administrators. They are used all over the state. They've been piloted in hundreds of classrooms. 
and the Common Core gave us the advantage of putting these materials together, pulling us together as general education administrators. So please, I urge you to stay the course and continue to support the State Common Core standards. Thank you. Next speaker, Vic Bugney. And following, it would be James Emerly. Emerling. Good afternoon, Superintendent, board members. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today uh, with regards to the Common Core State Standards. I too sit on um, with the ISD as a supervisor of curriculum and instruction. I am also a Michigan Mass Science Center director. And so I have had the opportunity to look at these standards from several different areas. In addition to that, I also bring the opportunity to speak to you as a representative of school districts from two counties in northern Michigan um, that are extremely rural areas. And I have seen the benefits of the Common Core State Standards do wonders up there with the teachers, the staff, and other stakeholders involved. Not only does it give them a learning outcome and an understanding for students at the end of a grade level, like you're all aware as to why we adopted these standards, but the collaboration and the work that's now taking place with these teachers and these school districts that sometimes schools have to travel over an hour and a half just to get to the next district to be able to collaborate has really been quite impressive to me as someone who's new to the area but also seen a lot of different levels of collaboration in the state. So I won't take up much of your time today because I know you understand the benefits to the Common Core and the aspects of being able to stay the course and keep the direction leading towards student true understanding and student learning. But I do encourage you to make sure that this message continues throughout the state and that we ask the teachers who are taking place and seeing these changes what it is that they see beneficial to them. Because with what I've seen and what I've understood my districts to be able to do has truly, truly been a benefit for our students, their learning, and their future success. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Emerling, <coughs> followed by Larry Thomas. Hello, my name is James Emerling, and I too am an ISD employee, a Michigan Mass Science Center Network Director, and I also uh, am a leader in the St. Clair Hub of the Michigan STEM Partnership. And on behalf of those organizations, I've been asked to come share my uh, experience with the Common Core and, uh, and to lend my support to that. Um, <clears throat> but I want to speak from a personal experience. Um, looking back at my college days, I regularly tutored people in chemistry and one of the things that I, I was amazed by was the fact that people uh, saw things differently than I did. That they, uh, that I could sit there and I could take an equation and I could manipulate it to, to get the outcome that I needed. Others couldn't. If the teacher didn't present it in that way, they couldn't manipulate it. They couldn't figure out how to, how, how to change that formula around to give them the results they needed. And uh, I think that that's propagated by our current system in that uh, the current set of standards in just focusing on those rote types of skills lends itself to that checklist approach. And kids can't take that knowledge and extend it beyond that learning that, they, that they've done in the classroom to make it realistic and real world. Now, uh, with the Common Core, there's some hope of this change. Uh, as far as mathematics goes, we have uh, mathematical practices. Uh, and the idea behind those mathematical practices is to <coughs> take that mathematics and, and, and uh, provide students with an understanding, a deeper level understanding of mathematics, so they can apply it in different ways and extend their learning beyond what's taught in the classroom. So um, uh, that's one way that I, I believe that the Common Core could really make a difference. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is with English language arts. Um, I read a little bit about some of the opposing opinions, and I, I, I saw that they were against uh, bringing aboard um, uh, more uh, informational literacy. And I was kind of shocked by that, um, and I don't think that they really understood the argument that they were making, because uh, with, with um, the Common Core, we do, uh, or they are encouraging more informational literacy, 
but not at the expense of, uh, of reading classics and things like that. But, uh, but rather, the informational literacy is also put into the science class and put into the other subject areas, such as social studies and technical subjects. And so, uh, in, in, in reflection, I want you to think about which do you use more, informational literacy or the classics? I know in my position, I read informational literacy online, I read it in workbooks, I, read, I study it, I research it, uh, and so those things are a lot more ap applicable to those kids. And so I think that, again, that's a second way that the, we're supporting those kids and, and moving them forward by, by using the Common Core. <coughs> Thirdly, the smarter balance. We know that uh, our current Michigan uh, MEEP assessment doesn't give us the results or doesn't give us the information that we claim it does or that we use it for, I should say. Uh, using Smarter Balance, you have a more uh, a full suite of assessment possibilities, from the formative assessment that the teacher was talking about just a few minutes ago, to uh, to actual uh, performance assessments where kids are are performing and doing whatever it is that you taught them, and extending it to a real world application. And so, I, I think that the Common Core uh, really can extend us beyond what we're currently doing. So, uh, with that, um, I'd like you just to think about. If you can, if those ideas resonate with you, then then I think that you agree with me in supporting it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next speaker is Larry Thomas, followed by Ann Foot. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Flanagan and the Board of Education. My name is Larry Thomas. Um, I'm the Executive Director of School Quality at Oakland Schools, and I'm here today on behalf of the Michigan Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, or Michigan ASCD. As the president of that association, I've been asked by the colleagues across the state to come and urge the board to stay the course with the Common Core and the science standards <coughs> coming forward, as well as to work towards the Smarter Balanced Assessments. Those collectively together, uh, I'll, I'll just bring up two points that are in the testimony they sent, will help level the playing field for students across the United States that choose in their states to be part of this. It is nothing that's being mandated to states, it's been a choice. And we commend you as a State Board of Education for moving that forward for all of our kids. Actually having the same, the same standards available for students across the county, across the state, across the nation is a huge effort forward for all of our children, and please do not back away from that. Within that context, it's not a curriculum, it's a framework, and we all know that it's a framework that we as educators have to diligently work together in order to move forward and deliver what we need for all of our kids that are different in different contexts, in different parts of the state, and different parts of the country. And if we're going to be globally competitive, it's time we, we, we own up to what we need to do and what smarter balanced assessments can bring to the table in the formative nature of helping teachers collaborate with assessment data in order to look at the quality of the instructional practices that they're delivering day to day to the children in their classrooms is nothing like we've ever seen before. We're excited about it and we're nervous about it, but we know that's where we need to go. We commend you and we encourage you, stay the course, please. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Ann Foote, followed by Chris Jurians. My name is Ann Foote. I have to address you all. Thank you for letting me come here this afternoon. I live in Jenison, Michigan, 2635 Cedar Grove North. I was brought up in Grand Rapids for 70 of my 78 years and had a wonderful education. And I'm looking forward to having my children and grandchildren receive the same education that I did. I believe that the Common Core is a drop from the educational tree. It's bruised and it's bruised inside and out. And I would like you to consider staying the course with regular education to give people an opportunity to have an interaction with the teacher, to have that individual attention that they need. Some children come to school with so much baggage that they don't know who they can turn to, but they can turn to a teacher. And as a grandparent, I would suggest that people my age go back to education, go back to the schoolroom with children that are underprivileged at this point, and walk alongside of them and give them that extra nudge that they need to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. 
Chris Jurians is the next speaker, followed by Valerie Mills. My name is Chris Jurians. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I have a son who's a sophomore in high school in a charter school. Um, I'm here today to talk against Common Core because I don't think it's the right thing to do for our children. When I was in school, they had stuff they called vocational education. This is what we need instead of Common Core. But Grand Grandholm, Governor Granholm signed a memo of understanding in entered into an agreement to implement Common Core state standards. Governor Snyder took the lead from there. In order to get funds from the Race to the Top, which was a Arne Duncan and Obama program, he had to give up control of our education and curriculum at the local and state levels and sell the soul of our education system to the federal government. Along with Michigan, 45 other states in the District of Columbia signed on not because Common Core standards are better, but because they each wanted a share of the federal dollars involved. What all the states fail to re realize is that with federal dollars come federal strings. The states were, had to sign, were told they had to sign on to the Common Core before they were even written or forfeit their Title I funding. Title I funding is money that many schools in the se severe straits they're in now live or die by. The Common Core is a political document with an identifiable <coughs> ideology and history that has contributed greatly to the current document. It is important to question who decides which, what research is used and how that research is presented and used. Why should the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or Rupert Murdoch be telling us how to teach our kids and what we need to teach our children? The Common Core materialized as a tool of the private sector. It was not sought by educators or those who care about students or the future of the common good. Common Core was meant for political gain and economic profit. Textbook publishers, testing companies, and the IT people needed to install the computers and software in the schools are among some of the people who stand to gain the most from the Common Core implementation. Of the four required bench requirements of implementing Common Core is international benchmark standards. Who decide what was benchmarked? Are we modeling our schools after the United Nations or a European model? Not all students are going to be rocket scientists or go on to college. Many kids would rather go into another field of skilled trades. The Pioneer Institute estimates that nationally the cost of Common Core is $16 billion. If you divide that among 46 states, that is approximately $3 billion per state. If you divide that up among the different districts, it is more money than many financially strapped school districts have available. The IT costs alone of implementing the standardized testing are going to be huge. Unconsidered costs including substitute teachers while training regular teachers how to use the new system, new textbooks, new computer, and other hardware for adaptive <coughs> testing. Common Core was developed by CCSSO and the National Governors Association, both of which are extremely well funded by the Gates Foundation. To quote a line from the movie, show me the money. The states that have that adopted Common Core had no field testing of it, and our children are being used as guinea pigs for the implementation of Common Core, thanks to Achieve and the Ma Gates I'm Foundation. Sorry, your time is okay, up. I'm done. Thank you. For that reason, please opt out of Common Core. Thank you. Our next speaker is Valerie Mills, followed by Robbie Kramer. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is Valerie Mills. I'm a mathematics education consultant at Oakland <coughs> Schools. I'm currently the president of the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics. I want to share two stories that are intended to illustrate the important resources we're just beginning to leverage from <coughs> collaborations around the Common Core. Resources we believe will pay big dividends for Michigan students and for their teachers. The first story comes from a pilot and review workshop we ran this year <coughs> excuse me, with a group of some 200 elementary teachers working together to develop Common Core curriculum materials. During a session, one of the teachers in the fourth grade group raised a question about how students' understanding of measurement concepts is likely to develop across the elementary years. 
Until about 12 months ago, the answer to her question would only have been found scattered among multiple studies buried in research publications. The thing is, the acceptance of the Common Core by 45 states has prompted working groups of university faculty to begin to synthesize research like this into a number of free online resources, each organized around the Common Core. So that literally within a few minutes, this teacher and her colleague had multiple relevant vetted research um, um, materials with which to help them answer these questions. The story um, that you hear is about two important levels of collaboration that are already producing results, one at the state level among teachers and one nationally among academic faculty, both directly enabled by the Common Core. Story number two comes from a series of national meetings I've attended over the last couple of weeks um, as the supervisor president for our national organization. My first stop was a meeting of the Michigan Common, or the Mathematics Common Core Coalition. This is a small group that um, includes only the presidents of the four national math education associations, along with representatives from the National Governors Association and the CCSSO. This young organization's sole mission is to ensure the successful implementation of the Common Core. The next day I met with a slightly larger group, the Conference Board of Mathematical Science. This is a group also composed of presidents, but this group has 17 of America's mathematics as well as mathematics organizations represented. Again, we heard about how each organization is working to provide resources and training to support the Common Core. As a lifelong member of Michigan's math education community, I've seen no fewer than five wholesale Michigan redos of curriculum. Each time I was faced with the challenge of implementing these standards and adjusting teaching strategies with support from no further afield than my colleagues down the hall. Now, for the first time in my 30-something years, um, the Common Core State Standards have sparked coordinated, thoughtful, focused collaborations among the mathematics community in Oakland, in Michigan, and across the country. Effectively, one sustained conversation with a common goal of helping every child in our land learn mathematics. I encourage you to join my colleagues and I as we embrace this opportunity to leverage the intellectual resources of a nation in support of Michigan's children. Our next speaker is Robbie Kramer, followed by Paul Drummond. Good afternoon. I'm Robbie Kramer and I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Science Teachers Association. Our children in Michigan come to us knowing how to think and how to ask questions. I think of myself when I was a little girl. My grandma was a celery farmer and she taught us how to plant celery seeds and they started their crop in the windows of the dining room and in the living room and the question was, why are you planting them there, grandma? What are you doing? Help me understand. And my mother said I continued to ask questions and forever. Our role as educators is to help children answer their questions, but also to be able to ask deep questions, complicated questions, questions that help them to construct their own knowledge and indeed to make sense of their world. That whole process of asking questions, answering them, conducting perhaps investigations, that help them to find that evidence, to make that claim, and share why they think this is the right answer. And then to be able to explain their thinking, their reasoning. As we continue to help our kids become deep thinkers, rich thinkers, complicated thinkers, we need resources. The Michigan science teachers believe that the next generation science standards will help us to do that. We believe the next generation science standards reflect our thinking as we participated in all of the reviews throughout the last year and a half. We tracked our responses when we sent them in and we looked to see what they did with what we gave them. And we know they listened to us. We believe the next generation science standards will help Michigan teachers to teach a deep and to provide a deep, rich science knowledge base. <coughs> blending cross cutting concepts and disciplinary core ideas into the practices of doing scientists. How do scientists think? 
How do they ask questions, answer questions, make models, and have those debates where they challenge the thinking of others back and forth, but listening with dignity and respect. We encourage you, too, to look deeply at these standards and to think about the possibilities for Michigan's children as we indeed in our schools all across the state prepare the workforce for business and industry in Michigan and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Drummond followed by Matthew Shepard. <coughs> Good afternoon, Superintendent, President Austin, and the Board. Um, I'm Paul Drummond with the uh, Michigan Science Teachers Association. I'm a former past president and conference chair. I also sit on the board of the Square One Education Network, which was formerly the Convergence Education Foundation, which is an organization that supports teachers and schools that are succeeding against all odds in providing programs, unique programs, that support STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in a unique way. I wish to echo what Robbie Kramer just said from the MSTA, and I want to emphasize that Michigan has been a lead state, one of 28 states in the development, the internal review, as well as the public reviews that have gone on throughout the state. Michigan, with its science education leadership and its teachers, have exercised a heavy influence on, this, on these uh, performance expectations. And I want to emphasize the idea of performance expectation because it changes science education from a noun to a verb. A very unique piece of this is the fact that the science and engineering practices are embedded in every expectation from kindergarten through 12th grade. Actually, we have already been moving in this direction with the way we deliver science, but this actually gives us even more rigor than we have now. And then finally, as far as the Square One Education Network goes, which is, a, again, a, a, a board made up of business and education leaders, these programs are directly in line with engaging students in developing programs such as innovative vehicle design, where they actually build vehicles, putting physics and chemistry into practice, applying them in real ways. And as such, I urge you to support their adoption Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Shepard, followed by Sandra York. Good afternoon. I'm Matthew Shepard, and Vice Chair of Shiawassee County 912 Commission. We foster a re restoration of individual liberty uh, through education and civic awareness. Uh, my main point is if Common Core is incorporated throughout the state. It's just another ploy by the UN to not only remove the Constitution from the history books and everything else, but to go to a one world order. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sandra York, <coughs> followed by. Actually, I believe Sandra York's our last speaker. Does anyone else have any forms? If so, I'd like to have them, please. Um, I'm Sandra York with the Michigan Parent Teacher Association. And um, this board has heard from me before on the Common Core State Standards. PTA strongly supports the standards and encourages this, this board to continue along the path that they started a while back. Um, the more I listen to the arguments against the Common Core, the more rationale I hear in support of the Common Core. We hear a lot of misinformation, myths perhaps, that really, for the most part, can be waylaid pretty readily. Um, I listened to the question from Representative Zemke asking, how do we excite students? And I think I'll address that in just a moment. Representative Howerlich, um, who said he does not support the Common Core, suggests leaving local decisions, uh, or that the local decisions empower parents and families. And I suggest a different way of looking at that. Um, 
The Common Core state standards not only empower parents and families, they empower students and they empower educators. We've heard a lot of testimony to that effect or commentary, I guess, would be a better word here. Um, as a parent, I would think that understanding the expectations for your students would be considered, or your children would be considered critical. To be able to move from state to state and know that your child is not a year behind, or even a year ahead, because that is as disempowering for a child when they're sitting in a class going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you really need them to be engaged from the minute they're in the door to the last minute they leave the door. Empowering students with a foundation, foundation that allows them to do anything. As a 13-year-old, I may not think I want to go to college. I may think I want to be a plumber, and that is a very valid occupation. However, later, I may decide I want to do something else. And I should have the foundation to make that change at any point in my life. Empowering educators, uh, we, the, the Common Core State Standards do keep the curriculum local. What it does is give standards. Years ago, I taught with a contract program where we taught higher level mathematics concepts in classrooms all over Detroit. It was my third year when I became just so comfortable with that curriculum that I could do everything around it. I could, had better classroom management skills. I could be more creative with my curriculum. And that's the beauty of the Common Core State Standards. It gives the basic framework and it leaves educators the open floor to do whatever they want to engage those students, to excite those students, and to move along as things in the world change. I have two seconds, but it, this might take three. The last thing I want to say is we should not be afraid to keep take these standards where they need to be because we have other challenges at our door right now. Those challenges aren't going to go away if we don't implement the Common Core State Standards. We have a responsibility to take care of both. And thank you for the extra few seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the forms that I have. I do have um, two pe three people that do not wish to speak. Isabel Terry wants to be on record that she's against the Common Core. Tina DuPont wishes to be on record that she's against the Common Core. And I have some written information um, supporting the Common Core from John Gubera of the College Board that I will pass around to you. I think that's the end of public participation. Thank you, Mertz. Great example of the diversity of our nation. It's really interesting to watch and hear different views. I mean, and I think it's good for us to listen to each other's perspectives and, and try to learn something from that. So thank you all for taking the time to be here. We're still kind of in the morning in one sense, so we're going to item C. We had a full and good morning. Um, and this is something that's actually been on the dockets for a while, and I know Eleanor White and Sally Vaughn are going to join at the table here. It's a presentation on low incidence disabilities teacher preparation initiative. Just to remind the board and then and then uh, Michelle and Lupe as new board members, this was that issue that back to Liz Bauer's time really, I think got us to focus on some of this it was a result of the closures and concern for future closures and programs for low incidence disabilities. The State Board of Ed asked us as a staff to explore options to ensure that Michigan has an ample supply of teachers trained to work with students with low incidence disabilities and this is where our chance to kind of provide you with that um, update and Eleanor I think there's some folks in the audience that you also wanted to thank uh, as we started. Were there some folks in the audience that you thought you might want to thank? Well, I'm going to thank the group, but I think I'd, I'd first want to acknowledge my assistant director, Terry Johnson, who refused to do this today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne Winkleman, uh, who does so much support from the office. Um, I want to recognize the rest of the committee. There are people here from the Office of Special mm -hmm. Education, and I understand one of the host universities for the program we're going to reduce is here. Western Michigan, right? Okay, thank you. Hi, staff, the rest of you. So, <coughs> this is the most of you. You'll ever see. <laughs> so, following up on what Mike said, uh, this has been a national concern uh, with low incidence programs and in universities not being able to continue with them because they, they work with such a small number of students because the number, uh, small number of college students because the number of students in the K-12 system is also relatively small. Um, but Eleanor and Terry, along with the other staff, worked with a fairly large stakeholder group 
to come up with a recommendation that we think is very innovative and creative as far as a way of making sure that we do have qualified teachers to work with students with the low incidence disabilities. And I think as Eleanor walks you through it, you'll see that this is something that we think can also be a model for other programs that may be uh, in, in danger of closing at the university level. Eleanor? All right. I thank you for the opportunity, and if you take a look at the, the uh, slide, the tile, you'll see that I always try to start with students because that's about perspective for me. Our discussion today is about supporting a small population of learners. The students represent less than 1% of all students in Michigan. It is because this group of students is so small and their needs so specialized that our development of skilled professionals to support them is so critical. You hear us talk about the TIPI, or if you've seen this in your notes for the last few months, the Low Incidence Teacher Preparation Initiative. By the time we finish, you'll know it as the Michigan Consortium for Teacher Endorsement for Deaf and Hard of Hearing and Visual Impairments. And because those of us in special education love acronyms so much, we haven't come up with one for this, but I want you to know we're meeting about it. <laughs> <laughs> the endorsement program that the Office of Special Education has developed has a comprehensive curriculum that complies with multiple state regulations and certification requirements. It is both new and exciting. The option that is going to be presented today is the result of over 70 stakeholders, several who are present today, several who I've introduced specifically. I would ask that all of those who participated who are in the room now please stand and be acknowledged. Don't be reluctant. Come on. There. Come on. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All 70 were going to go comma today. I told them there would not be room. <laughs> Got that right. <laughs> students with an IEP make up roughly about 14.5% of the Michigan students. If you see the numbers there, they may seem small. The students with hearing impairment represent about 1.3% of the students with disabilities and there are less than 1% of the students with a visual impairment in Michigan, less than 1% of the students with disabilities. Across the country, colleges and universities are closing preparation programs for teachers in these areas as the disabilities recur in a small number of youth and enrollment in the college and university programs are small and not cost effective. As you can see, the offerings for students interested in pursuing a career as an educator for students who are blind or partially sighted are limited. Special education has many shortage areas, and among them are teachers for our low incidence populations. We need teachers with highly skilled, specialized skills to educate our students who are deaf and hard of hearing and those with visual impairment. I've used the term low incidence population. Students with disabilities fall into two basic categories. The higher incident populations include disability categories that you hear very often, like learning disabilities, emotional impairment, and more often, autism spectrum disorder. Visual impairment and hearing impairment are two of those uh, categories for uh, low incidence population students. Others would be other health impairments, although it's growing, and also students with significant cognitive impairments. I want to make sure that I say to you that deans of colleges do value these programs. They value the preparation of teachers for low incidence populations, but programs are costly and there are so few students who are going into that area, it's very difficult to keep and maintain qualified staff and to keep the quality of those programs at a standard which they would like. MDE staff was charged with exploring options to ensure Michigan has an ample supply of teachers who have this specific training. This is part of our IDEA requirement and anyone who would like to look it up, that statute is 300156, it's personnel qualifications. A work group of over 70 members. This work group was formed in response to the state board's request and they have worked for several years. Any of you who has ever worked with a group 
would be aware if you're working with a group of 70 people, it would take you several years just to figure out who was at the meeting, let alone to come to consensus. So I am excited, <coughs> particularly I'm excited that Terry Johnson was chairing that committee <laughs> of 70 people. <laughs> I worked for a superintendent prior to coming to the um, to this to the board. Where am I? Michigan <laughs> Department of Education. And one of the things that uh, he talked about whenever we had uh, something that was a challenge, he told us to look at it as an opportunity. And this really became an opportunity for us to think outside the box and look at another way to prepare teachers to, to for the the students that we really need in Michigan. I won't read this to you, but you'll see that we have developed a program that is comprehensive, that it involves in state university as well as out state universities, and I think it is an exceptional result for preparing teachers in Michigan for this very specialized population. Proud to announce that the two host universities are Aquinas and Western Michigan University and the classes are going to be a combination of online and web conferencing as well as face-to-face -face. and you might think well how are you going to have face-to-face -face? well if you were teaching sign language you'd need to be face-to-face -face. there are other courses of course that we could do completely online I had to ask what EPIs are educational preparation initiatives no institutions which used to be IHEs, I'm dating myself, um, have agreed to participate in various ways. And as you will note, these universities represent a wide range of universities. These are the schools that are supporting programs for the students who are training for deaf and hard of hearing programs. And here are the EPIs for the endorsement for the visual impaired. We have um, a collaborative between two offices, the Office of Special Education and the Office of Professional Preparation. And you will see that we have delineated the processes so that we are clear on what the responsibilities for the Office of Special Education are and those that will be um, carried out by the Office of Professional Preparation. It's really important, I think that's one of the things that we've talked about a lot lately in our office, is that you do not graduate or receive a special education teaching certificate. You receive a teaching certificate. And when you work with special education students with disabilities, what you have is an endorsement that sits on that certificate. So all teachers are qualified to be both general education teachers as well as special education teachers. So I think that is so important and I just I want to take that opportunity to share that. It's my favorite slide. We're ready to go. Fall 2013. My next favorite slide, you don't contact me for questions. <laughs> you contact Joanne Winkleman in our office. That's the theme going here, Eleanor. <laughs> And just to, to say, this is very exciting to see this many states because the other states are feeling the same pinch that we are. And for us to have this collaborative, and it's great to have Western be the, the, the host and lead for one of those that uh, I really do think for some of the other program areas that we're having challenges, uh, this could be the way to do it. And the partnership between uh, Flora's shop and I think Eleanor's has been very, very good. Her shop got it too that this is what the endorsement needs to look like and then Flora's shop is figuring out, okay, here's how they apply for that endorsement. And like Eleanor said, this is not a new certificate. They already have a certificate. This is an endorsement that goes on top of it. Mike? Thank you, Flora, also, Ben, and your whole team. I know, and thank you, Eleanor. We, um, this started, as you know, with the board's encouragement. I think Liz Bauer had a big hand in it, and it really, I, I think you framed it very well. This gave us an opportunity, because I, I would probably say that when we left the meeting that first night, we were gone. <laughs> and um, I think you handled it spectacularly, even though it took a few <laughs> years. So thank you both, and thanks for the board's encouragement. And there's time for questions. And Dan. Uh, one comment and one question, I think. Uh, the comment is um, there's been a lot of talk, uh, oh, I don't know, for the last year, longer nationally, about uh, kind of uh, markets and education. Um, 
And there are, there are places certainly where markets do not work. Um, and I think that uh, uh, in service of special ed, well, as currently designed, the markets don't work. And um, uh, one is in service of special, of students with special needs, unless we actually um, uh, weight funding such that um, the market is incentivized to serve those students more effectively. You know, my fear currently is that we're not adequately as a state serving special needs students. Um, the same is true, obviously, of uh, teachers um, that are being prepared in really small numbers for very specialized careers. Um, and one of the responses to kind of these marketplace issues um, is consortium. I'm actually reminded of the fact that General Motors and other car companies got together years ago to start to develop hybrid engines together, right? Well, there's like a ex really expensive thing to do. I mean, it makes sense for some of these competitors to come together and work on it. Um, and that's the, this is the kind of thing I think that we have to see more of um, uh, given the kind of environment in Michigan around K-12 education. So I'm really excited about this. The quick question is, so thank you for bringing this, and I think it's a great I mean, it's just, it's, um, I suspect we'll see more of it um, in response to some of the challenges that, that the system faces, whether that's at the higher ed level or the K-12 level or students with special needs or what have you. Um, the question is, uh, as host universities are, is it the case, am I understanding that to mean that only students at Aquinas in Western Michigan will be available, will be able to get the endorsement, or no, no students from any Michigan university can come to, how does no, that work? No, they're the host in terms of um, their enrollment and their processes will go through that university, but they do not have to be enrolled in that university. So if I'm a University of Michigan School of Ed student, I can enroll online at Western Michigan or whatever, however yes. this works, yep. and yes. get so an endorsement? Yes, be a process so that they can be accepted into the program. So it, it's, it's like someone is the keeper of your coursework to assure that you have completed all the requirements prior to it coming to, the, to, the, uh, to our office to determine that it needs, meets the requirements. All right. I'm sorry. The gentleman from Western behind you is in my line of vision was shaking his head no. And I don't know if that's because he's not a fan of U of M or if it's... I was waiting for someone to say that. Dan, Dan, you took the bait. I didn't see my thumb go off. I did take the bait. So you may leave, sir. <laughs> 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 but did I describe it accurately? Yeah. <laughs> right, we all know how to get Dan's reaction now. Just get behind <laughs> the fire. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about the program. It, it says it's a mixture of face to face, online, um, that kind of stuff. I'm just wondering how much of it is. Face-to-face uh, -face and how you would accommodate that? Well, I think very little of it is face-to-face. -face. Most of it because it's, you know, their students are going to be from all over. Right. Um, and so that I, I, that's why I use the example of sign language because that's very specialized and would require that. Um, the only other thing I thought about, and, and Colette, you can help me, orientation and mobility, I would assume that if you were training in something like orientation and mobility, that might have to be face-to-face. -face. Orientation and mobility is if you're trying to help a student who is blind learn how to maneuver a certain uh, area or space. Obviously, if you needed to learn how to do that, that would be something you would probably need to be with an instructor. Uh, but I think that there will be some hybrid courses as well, so that there will be some learning that you will do online and then some opportunity to be with an instructor. And some of the face-to-face -face may be on the weekends or during the summers to also accommodate some of that. Kathleen, please. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing this report. We were really waiting, waiting for this for quite a while. We were all, I remember when we had Carol O.E. here from Michigan State. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't too happy. So, over the coals, <laughs> we thought they should continue the program. Uh, so I'm glad to see that this is a collaborative program and that we're working together with other universities. But in the case, I was wondering how you can do it uh, so much online. And I wondered in the case of what Michelle was just bringing up, uh, if the training for orientation and mobility and you say face to face, 
Do they have to be at Aquinas College or Western Michigan to do that? Or where would they get that face to face? It might be at any of the universities. It does not have to be at that particular university or it could be at a site. It does not have to be at one of the host universities. Oh, would it be a teacher from one of those universities? It would, it would be a teacher from one of the universities that is participating. There was a long, that list that we showed you for deaf of hard of hearing versus the other universities for okay. visual impairment. It could be staff from any of those universities. Okay. And many so times when university professors who are adjuncts of uh, those of us who participate in those activities, you don't necessarily do it on campus. Oh, okay. Because you know, some of these Minot State universities in, in North Dakota. Right. It's a bit hard to get to. Absolutely. <laughs> so if they have professors that they would come to the students. Yes. Is that the idea? Yes. Oh, that, that would be good. Okay, I was worried that the uh, online had to be supplemented somehow we got to get face to face. She's going to Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen, please. Uh, <coughs> uh, I just hate to let you off without asking one of the directed, deep and probing questions that um, Elizabeth Bauer emailed mm -hmm. the board uh, needed to be uh, discovered about the rich background. So I'm sorry, I, don't, I shouldn't be flippant, but can you? I would like to find out a little bit more about the cross-cutting curriculum that Elizabeth cited here because she's very excited about this. Oh, I yeah. know. Yeah. I read her email as well, Love so I was prepared you know for I'm your question. To be <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm not that dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? What I think about is is that we we have to look at the changes that have taken place, and and it's not that the courses that were offered at specific universities were not great courses with great content. There are just not enough students for the programs to continue. So what has happened is, is we've taken the best of all of those programs and figured out different ways to deliver them, and in lots of different places. Thank you. Liz was sorry she couldn't be here I think I think Liz is watching as we speak. Uh, I'm sure she is. <laughs> She's our virtual board member, and I also wanted to thank you and uh, learn all involved, and also appreciate Liz's. Um, uh, historic and current encouragement to us to do what we should be doing. In this case, this is a great example in my view of significant thoughtful attention to a very important um, educational topic that affects a relatively small number of individuals, however, d does deliver on the promise that we are taking seriously enriching the lives and improving the education of all Michigan young people. So it's, mm -hmm. it's worth the effort and I really appreciate the extra effort that, that went into this. Yeah, well, I wanted to say that too. With the, even if it's only one percent, one percent needs to one percent. The education is much more than ninety-nine percent. We could use that one percent, ninety-nine percent of the way Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's the one percent mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. These are Thanks. excellent comments. Thank you. And in terms of the one percent, I mean, our work every day, we kind of try to say in our mind, if this were your child or your sister's child or someone you knew intimately, are we doing the right thing? You know, Kathleen, to your point about, or someone mentioned, uh, well, I don't want to give the punchline away here. My wife and her sister were in Chicago and uh, they were walking along one of the streets and suddenly they almost stumbled on someone who was sweeping up the sidewalk and all that and suddenly this person popped up and my wife said, oh my gosh, Carol. And Carol went, oh my gosh, Anna. It was Carol Ames who immediately wanted to explain she wasn't doing community service, that, <laughs> she had, uh, that this was something she volunteered for periodically. Then they live in Chicago now, and she literally goes around and helps clean up. Uh, so I thought, I thought it was a nice story, you know, funny to begin with, but also that it, uh, you know, a former dean at state sees her role in a community to help uh, you know, help it make it better. Mm -hmm. We still use the story that, yeah, right, not community service. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. So now, already, we're good afternoon. The time is now 2.29 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of May 14th is hereby called to order. The first item is approval of State Board of Ed minutes from April 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Lupe. Okay. This is supported by Dan. Corrections, discussion. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Whipping right through public participation. We did that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go to our, you know, our new process the last few months, but introducing employees and the deputies are going to do that. I think Sally, Susan, and Carol each have some that are new to us. Well, 
Robin, and we're going to say who you are and what you do. I'm Robin Hanson. I'm the newest member of the school reform office, and that is the office that is charged with monitoring the implementation of transformation and turnaround plans for our lowest, very lowest performing schools here in Michigan. That's required by law. Welcome, Robin. Thanks. Bernard. Welcome, Bernard. And we, we just wanted to acknowledge that in the facilities area there is a new resident care aide over at the School for the Deaf in Flint. His name is Franklin Ash. He's there with the students today, but we are keeping our facilities for the kids safe. Well, let's give a welcome to our new team members. Thank you. President's report. John, please. A couple things uh, briefly. Appreciating the testimony for and against the Common Core, I, I, I won't uh, belabor or re-articulate what I find to be very compelling and what I'm very proud of this board uh, and all those who, who testified uh, about the merits of it that uh, you know, we, we as a board uh, and as a state uh, are needing to continue to lay the foundation so all young people can be prepared for life and work with a solid uh, grounding and I think the, the eloquent testimony that you heard uh, in that regard is, is powerful and I, I want to thank my fellow board members frankly for their continued strong advocacy and Mike and the department for your uh, help and support and on this and the keeping a, a comprehensive uh, related Michigan Merit curriculum rigorous to provide again that foundation for whatever pathways young people choose, uh, as we saw this morning from the Stockbridge folks, uh, is part of our opportunity. And I'm delighted that we have you know, groups from business leaders to Michigan to the PTA to the uh, others that spoke today uh, representing so powerfully the importance of that. And I'm optimistic that we will continue on this course. So, um, second thing, I think I do hope that we as individual board members, as a state board, uh, perhaps in collaboration with uh, the committee uh, or, or legislators, we do need to uh, develop and lay out a kind of affirmative uh, roadmap for how we organize and fund education uh, that is uh, is both right and powerful. And I, I certainly I'm pledged to help us do that, and I hope everyone will want to do that. If there's one theme I think coming out of these public forums we're having, you know, more important I think than the um, the perception of concern about some of the more overreaching elements of the market creation that were coming out in Lame Duck or from the Oxford Foundation is this real desire, where is the game plan to provide the kind of affirmative support, help, and, and financing uh, for a, a new effective education system, however organized. I mean, we're really hearing people looking to us and others for leadership on that. People want affirmative vision for where we need to go and how we put that in place. And I think that's something we need to uh, step up to the plate to do. And I, I know um, we asked Mike to share, uh, as part of his report, recommendations on what is the purpose and goals of a hopefully you know, fundamentally redirected, reconstructed uh, effort to look at uh, education technology and its use to improve learning. Um, since we met, you know, it was very unfortunate that there was this um, revelation or issue of a uh, group that appeared to be and perhaps was, you know, a secret uh, organized to try to, with a particular mission as was articulated, uh, perhaps different than its intent, but certainly the way it was articulated by some to design an online learning program purposely to uh, reduce teachers with no mention of how this improves the quality of education and to cut costs. I mean, that is not a goal for what we want to help create. And so I think we're very eager to, uh, we need to figure out how we use technology to improve learning and how we do that well. And an exploration of that that has some purpose and some uh, clarity around what is the goal of this project is uh, perhaps very valuable to continue on, but uh, certainly uh, something that is different in its intent. Uh, we need to all be reassured uh, that we have our eye on a target here that's going to help us uh, do something that improves learning. So appreciate that. 
Thanks, John. Well, let me just lead right into that then. And, and today, if I could put in context, this is kind of the first phase as we would see it, and we'd like this first wave to pro first phase to probably kick off. Uh, depending on how you see this, maybe even immediately. The first thing is I would I would say this that. At the Governor's Summit, I know John and I and others of you were expressing concern about what was then known as this, I don't know that I should even repeat the name <laughs> and keep it going, but a certain kind of works. And I had said, and John and others had said, we thought uh, minimally this was a perception issue problem and maybe worse. But minimally it was that. So I had articulated when asked by the Detroit News that we were pulling our folks from it and we would continue from there. Um, so sometimes, and then it, it, it turned into a headline that was a little more aggressive than I had said it, which is state chief says get rid of secret group, and it was above the fold, and it was, uh, well, the reason I even point that out is I think that's one of the reasons then that, okay, state chief, then I invite you to lead this discussion, um, and that was, an offer made by the by Governor Snyder, and I think it was done with sincerity. I mean, I think it was done with the idea that um, if you and others think this needs to change, then why don't you lead a discussion? And um, as some of you know, I had a few minutes to decide that as they were ready to try to move on, and I, I made a call to do so. Um, having said that, I think John said this correctly. I mean, I think if there's concerns about what we're presenting today, um, we could take another approach. So let's just think about it that way. What I would like to do first, though, it, it, well, let me just tell you how, in my mind, it, although this may scare you how my mind works, but <laughs> I, I, I think best the first minute I wake up. And I literally woke up about 10 days ago. And we've been muddling through different ways. Who would we ask to be part of the task force? You know, the mindset you tend to have on these. And I woke up thinking, is there a way, because of what I said earlier about how we did the paper screening and how all my worry about that got, got removed when I saw the work that people did here on the paper screening for the deputy position and that you can actually be very inclusive and you don't have to own everything. I mean, some people, I've, I've never made, I've been a superintendent 25 years and I've never had more than two people, sometimes three, sent to me. Because I've always tried to find ways that you get in the school district that I was in, that you have committees working, because they, they own the leadership ultimately. I'm, you know, in my case, it's going to be reasonably soon uh, a move on. But even if it wasn't, you know, we have to co-select. Co so that gave me a lot of confidence. So what popped into my head is, why not totally inclusive? Why not totally transparent? and came into the soups group, which I think was that day, and I saw some of the looks that I often get on a Friday, which is like, <laughs> and yet I can't thank these folks I'm going to ask to stand for a minute. But everyone who's kind of worked on this first, first phase for a minute, just stand up, and because and I, I, I think the board will be impressed, and I want them. Kaylee, I see over there. Mike, you, all of you stand up for just a moment. And these are folks that, in fairly short order, put together what you're going to see as at least our, our proposal for a first first phase of this today. And I, I'm going to kind of cut through because I think what Mike's going to do, and, and if you don't recognize Mike Flaminio, it's because Mike's dressed up here. He looks like <laughs> I went to Mike's wedding and you're looking like your wedding day again, Mike. That's the Same first day. <laughs> uh, but I think he's going to um, kick this off together with Vanessa in a way that I think will help shape it rather than me. I had some verbiage here, but I think I'm going to just let this make itself self-evident, really. So, Michael, please. Okay. So, um, the way we were going to go about doing this is for the work group to actually be on Facebook. Probably no matter what we would have done, it would have had a social media component, but we're actually going to do it on uh, Facebook itself. And there's a lot of advantage, advantages of doing that beyond just being transparent and also inclusive. Um, it's a good way for people to find out about the um, information. So as we post stuff and as people visit and share and post their own stuff, those are opportunities for people within their own social networks to discover um, the content. So, you know, someone doesn't have to be watching the news tonight or tomorrow and this is, you know, any announcement or anything like that. Um, by interacting on their own screens with their own uh, friends and whatnot, this would be a way to um, find out about it. So that's one big advantage of doing this on, on, on Facebook and a social platform specifically. So um, here is the page. And um, we have some posts. The first post that we have here is actually a Mike 
This isn't point. live. This is this is just to demonstrate this. Right. So first uh, first video we have here is uh, Mike introducing the workers. Hi, I'm State Superintendent Mike Flanagan. I want to welcome you to the Education Technology Work Group. That's right. By joining us on our Facebook page, you will be on the work group. I was invited by the governor to lead a discussion on finding effective and innovative ways to better integrate technology in the Michigan system of education, both for today and into the future. So by liking this Facebook page, you'll be able to follow and participate in the work group discussion. This will be an evolving discussion that begins with a simple survey that you can access from the Facebook page. We will continue to have open and transparent discussions here that will be very inclusive. This work group is transparent to the extent that it's going out to the world where you are to see what is going on out there technology-wise. I didn't want to limit the work group to just the usual stakeholders. Uh, you don't have to be an educator to be involved. We, of course, want to hear from educators, but we also want to hear from the general public, from parents and students, from employers, early childhood care providers, um, college profs, uh, those in the foundation community, education advocates and reformers, technology experts, you know, you get, you get it. The, on, the online public work group is groundbreaking in helping us discuss and inform education policy, so please feel free to speak up and weigh in on the posting to this Facebook page. Be patient with us, too. As I said, this will be an evolving discussion process. We're trying to invent something that's inclusive and transparent. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So first, please take the quick survey to help us better understand what you're doing now and what you see as the education technology needs for our children in the future. Thank you so much. So the first component is a survey, and as you saw from the video, here's the permanent link of it right there on my mouse. Is um, you can access that survey. You don't need to have a Facebook account in order to access the survey. You could just uh, visit this site and find that link. But in addition to the Facebook page, we're also going to distribute a direct link to the survey, like through email. So I'm going to take a look here at the survey. Vanessa will uh, walk us through questions. So like Mike said, um, we wanted to, one of the reasons we wanted to start off with including a survey on the Facebook page is it's a vehicle for us to get the discussion going, as well as um, garner feedback in a really inclusive manner. So this discussion is both public as well as um, the survey helps us kind of structure some big areas of, of information. Um, it really is designed to gather information in a very inclusive and broad-ranging manner. So it's, it's going to be evolving, it's going to be big. You'll see as we look at the questions, um, the, the questions are very purposely open-ended because we didn't want to guide thinking into the traditional ed tech channels or in any channels. We want people to engage in a way that um, really makes the most sense to, to them and to be very um, wide ranging in, in how they reply. So when you go to the survey, we start with a one quick demographic question. We ask people to first pick which best describes your primary role regarding educational technology. We recognize that people will have multiple roles in how they engage with educational technology, but we want to um, ask people which one they're responding to as they take the survey. And you'll see at the drop-down menu, Mike was just demonstrating, so you can select one. And then we get right into the questions. Um, the first one, what does educational technology mean to you? So you can see that this is a, a big question, and we want to understand how people are thinking about um, this terminology and how else we might need to think about it as we move forward. Second question, um, or it's third question here, I guess, the second open-ended question, how do you see educational technology being used for learning currently? So the key here is we want to know how everybody sees it being used. Now, you don't have to be a teacher to answer this question. You can answer as a parent. You can answer as a, uh, an educator. You can answer as a community member or however you see educational technology being used. So this helps us take, a, in some sense, a scan of, of what people see going on right now. Question four moves us looking forward a little bit more. How might educational technology be used in the next 10 years? So what, this, this, there was some discussion about this at the table earlier. How do we see? What are the next big developments? What's coming? And again, our goal is to get this um, beyond the, the usual stakeholders because people are likely doing really great thinking about what educational technology should look like outside our normal um, boundaries of who, who we have these conversations with. And again, the discussion at the table earlier alluded to this. 
We have one close-ended question. How important is educational technology to learning? We think it, um, it's interesting to take, take stock of how a large group of stakeholders views this question and also to cross some of the other answers with this. Um, question number six. What do you see as the ultimate role or goal of educational technology? Again, this helps us look forward, looks, look towards some of the, the vision and um, the master plan, so to speak, or what people see should be part of that. Of that. And we want to, again, reach widely with, with this question. And then we leave, of course, additional comments box, so we're hoping that people will take advantage of that if there's feedback or thoughts that they want to share that we have not specifically asked about. Um, you know, some of you have seen me sit at the table before, um, but I'm here to say this is not meant to be a research study. It's meant to be a discussion. So we're okay with some of the open-endedness, and we're okay with the fact that this is going to help us um, surface themes, generate discussions, stimulate this conversation, and do it in a transparent manner. That, that is what we're trying to do here. Second part of the survey moves us into a few demographic questions. Um, we selected these demographics very specifically because we feel they have a potential interaction or relationship to technology. So we didn't ask every demographic question, but we did ask a few. So we do ask respondents what their age is through a drop-down menu. Um, and I think, Eileen, you were speaking earlier about the digital divide and the digital natives, and that's something we talk about a lot with technology, but we also didn't want to assume anything about how age interacted with, with technology. Or, you know, there's been a lot of research on it, but we also think that the discussion encompasses everybody and that we want to look at how responses go with age and help, help that inform the discussion. Um, second question, where do you live? Um, so we thought locale was a, a pretty critical factor to understand in terms of access, what's next. It might look different in a rural area than it might in an urban area, or maybe the state sees this in a very similar way regardless of locale. Um, sorry. N level of comfort with the use of technology in your personal school work life. Again, understanding what, how people are interacting with technology now, but also what they see in the future. And then we're curious to know if you are a Michigan resident. We hope this discussion is beyond the borders of Michigan. That would be very exciting. But we would like to know if you are a Michigan resident or not. We do have an optional box for email address. If, um, if people wanted to include that, we would follow up with them, potentially follow up with them. It would be an option. Um, but it does not have to be provided. And how we use that in the future would be kind of evolving. As the superintendent said, this is to start the discussion. And so that's what we think the questions do. So Linda's going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do from here. So the survey will be open beginning today through June 4th, and we will be monitoring the responses weekly to see what some of the interesting pieces might be that come back to us. What are the comments? What are people, comment what are people talking about? We're going to post the, a PDF of the comments weekly as well so that everybody can see what everybody has said. We will take out emails and any identifying pieces like that, but we're going to post everything pretty openly. Um, in addition to that, we're going to take a look at those comments and see if there are any interesting um, pieces that come out of it that we might want to ask questions about in the next week. So let's, for instance, say something about iPads comes up. So we might ask a question on the Facebook page itself about, so what do you think about using iPads in education? <coughs> do you see a role for them? What might that be? And just see what the conversation might, might evolve to. We'll be able to post um, questions weekly and get some more dialogue going. Once the survey closes on June 4th, staff will be reviewing all of the responses and uh, taking a look at what came out of it, and then we'll see what happens after that. So I will just say as well, the survey is only a component of this discussion. The, we really want this to be, um, and Mike said this when he started, doing it through Facebook allows it to be a social networking um, activity or enterprise. So the power in doing it this way is that it, it becomes an iterative discussion. Uh, the survey is part of that and helping us kind of gather information and feed that discussion, but the page itself stimulates further discussion and we want to really leverage, leverage that aspect of doing it on this platform. Um, so we're planning to do that as well. Okay, so um, in addition to the survey, in terms of the Facebook, you can, uh, people will be able to um, post comments directly to the page and anybody will be able to read them. Um, it will appear right in here once we get some comments. So that's another way people can interact in this. And then just show you some other posts that we have down the bottom. Uh, we have a post here highlighting the survey in addition to if you happen to miss it up in the top 
uh, top part you'll be able to uh, see there. Also, we have um, we set up a Twitter page, so so people are Twitter, Twitter feed, so people could um, interact that way. I like to say just like there's cat people and dog people, there are Facebook people and Twitter <laughs> people. So we'll get both um, both opportunities and some different things to leverage the strength of each of those platforms. So there's that right there. And then just like Linda said, we'll also have uh, posts ongoing uh, to keep the discussion going and help uh, spread the word. So that's it. Back to Mike. And then the intent behind this would be that we would we would really um, proactively try to communicate this opportunity. And I don't know if Marty wants to speak to that for a moment about how how well let me while you're while you're gathering your thoughts to come up. There's an issue related to to me the first thing to dispel was secret and who's selected. And we think that this clearly does that as a first step. Does it get to where we want to get ultimately on educational technology? Well, some of this will be informed by what we see in June, and then we bring it back to a board meeting at the June board meeting. So we're going to have a kind of a, I think, a rich discussion for this first phase, see what we get, see if it's kind of going the way we hope it's going with some, because those of you who've taught, and, and I, uh, to last year, taught at Wayne State for, for 15 years. I was a member of your union, as a matter of fact. I never quite made that connection with this now. <laughs> and, um, but I taught, and what I noticed is even with educators, especially night courses, they're tired. But even with educators, there's those that, ooh, 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 like Horshack, and there's others that are sitting there that you never really get engaged. And, you know, so what you try to do, and I think you heard a little bit of it from one of the presenters this morning, is the way that they're using different technology in the classroom to make sure all kids are heard or whether they're on the right page. So this is a way that, you know, you don't have to be the CEO of a technology company. Um, you don't have to be kind of one of the traditional uh, association leaders, let's say, that we often have on, ta in, in, uh, on task forces. And then we can take a deep breath and say, does this inform a different next step? Or what next step does this inform? And I think that's what we'd like to have your, your assistance on, to say the least, on the second phase. There. I appreciate it. I guess my reaction is a process, excellent, open, et cetera. I'm, I'm very um, focused on the goal of this work um, and in terms of the kind of the mission statement. Um, I would feel more um, comfortable if we were saying, we're looking for ways to find effective and innovative ways to integrate technology in order to improve learning and outcomes. Um, just to integrate technology for technology's sake, to me, is you know, potentially akin to um, choice for choice's sake, or it, it's too close to the goal is to create an, a technology product, a la the original non-named group. Um, so something that clearly kept reiterating that we're, we're coming up with many ideas, we're going to come up with recommendations, we're going to share ideas of how technology can be used, should be used, we want to use it to improve learning and outcomes. Is, is, is real important to me. It's like, why are we doing this? Good idea. Can we can insert that. And that's in this, this first organization piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Other, Eileen, please. Uh, so when will it be up? Well, we, you know, our intent is soon. But if with some accommodations that we might make today, I mean, we felt like the first goal would be if we could get it up as soon as today, we would probably do that. And part of it would be with what, let me just ask Marty to indicate how he, because part of this is if it's, if it's intended to be inclusive, but you don't reach out in enough of the areas, it's really not inclusive. So just maybe a brief, I'm sorry to. Well, the intent is to, as like Mike said, just throw as broad a net as possible. Um, initially starting off this launch and to do a press release to get the media uh, to expose um, its availability and also to send a, a letter of invitation out to a multitude of organizations, uh, groups, um, associations, um, you know, as we can and then ask them to share it. I mean, the, like Mike said earlier, the, the idea is not to keep it, you know, to the usual group of stakeholders, not the usual suspects as to open it broadly and that will enrich, you know, the robust conversation on the Facebook page and, and really, I think, enhance the conversation and enhance the ideas that are flowed. You know, not only, it's not just for educators, but it's also like asking employers what they look for. You know, what kind of, what kind of technology skills do you expect, you know, an employee to have? So it's kind of like to get the, you know, it's not just to get the technologies, but it's how, the, how do you use it to improve education and improve um, you know, the workforce in the future, too. I mean, our, our thinking is this is probably going to, 
be something in the results different than what we think right now. Whatever we're thinking right now, the odds are it's not going to be that. Um, but I think it can help us, especially if people, and you have to assume most people are going to fill out the demographics so they don't have to. And then if it helps you kind of get a sense of students and where they might be, if there's some generalities about that, teachers and where they might be. And, and then, you know, it, it, frankly, it takes care of leading a discussion as a first phase. There's more work to be done because then what? So, okay, we've done that. And then I think we need to come back here and try to think, then what? Now with the results that we have as of on this tentative schedule, like a June 4th, um, hopefully for the June meeting, at least some feedback on that. And then try to think, where do we bring this? To what kind of recommendations? To what insights do we have that we don't have now? And, you know, I, I, if there's any, I wouldn't even call it blowback. If there's any resistance at all, I think it might be with some who think it should be a, a tiny group that can really work on recommendations. Maybe that is a second iterative here based on things we learn. Who knows? Uh, but we're also a fairly small group that can do a lot of that possibly ourselves based on understanding the landscape here, you know, in terms of and with some authority. So I just think it, we decided don't try to invent this next phase yet until we see what this produces and then come in here and let's see what kind of, you know, meat and potatoes we want to put around this as a result of that. Eileen, please. Um, I, I just didn't, I, this is an afterthought, so I, I'm trying to think back to, this, to the questions you were asking, but if there's a way to say to people, have you heard of something that you haven't seen? In other words, have you read something or have, have you heard anecdotally at a meeting uh, and then identify the source? You know, is there a program that you've heard of that was really intriguing to you that you aren't familiar enough to get to share with us, except the, for the concept of the name? I, mean, I, I know that in the last four or five years that that's expanded my, that, that um, whether it's been Ed Week or some other uh, resource, just reading about something and then making a few phone calls has really given a lot of information. That is part of the process that we had talked about on how to, you know, propagate the, the Facebook pages to mm -hmm. offer prompt questions like that out to everyone who is, you know, face, this Facebook page like, liker. So it would be like, you know, Several times during a week, we'll just put a question out there, very similar. Right. I mean, that'd be a great question to maybe start with. Let's use that question. Let's use that as a starting. And we're open to others, too, and even if it's after today and you're thinking of something that, hey, I'd like to get some feedback on this kind of, we can post that question and see what we get. I think, I mean, I, I know just enough to be dangerous with some of this stuff, <laughs> and I might have mentioned to you I was a reluctant participant into the Flanagan clan Facebook. And, uh, but I realize all kinds of things that I never realized before, opportunities it gives you and with my job especially, I don't want to go you know, beyond the family here because I might accidentally <laughs> write something that I shouldn't or that could be misunderstood. But I think what it, 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 it's hard to describe until people start doing it. I think we're going to have insights that we can't even uh, anticipate just yet and we're going to have large numbers behind it and we're going to be able to see where it is with students versus where it is with a regular community member or where it is with teachers and, and then then we can go from there you know we'll have good data and we've got great data folks so and Kaylee I know is kind of modestly sitting over there but has had a hand in what I won't even begin to understand it but it's something about the way to check in on metrics different days so that you can kind of what might be a phrase to use that you're actually just to, to monitor the conversation so we can we can take a look at that data and see what is this audience really interested in and how do we gently direct the conversation yeah. in those directions. Yeah. And then you know the the other thing I think because when we finally took this on at first I uh, I think the greatest opportunity is does this help us think about the way we do the rest of our work in some ways. Um, you mentioned Liz earlier, but Kathleen's been a big proponent of this too for years, which is how do you really get the student voice? So I've been struggling for a few years because I have a quote student advisory council and I have a quote teacher advisory council, but there's 100,000 teachers. So we're sitting as a team, you know, once or twice a year with a teacher advisory group and somehow it, we're well intentioned, but that doesn't necessarily mean what teachers are thinking. So you could, you could envision this where if they're willing to put in age range or whatever, well, young teachers are maybe struggling with this that seasoned teachers are not. So you can start to think about how you direct professional development and stuff. Um, I just, we think it's a way for us to learn 
a whole other way of actually doing business. And the two best examples I can think of are the, the two we struggle with. Where I don't want to say we get great insights from both those advisory groups, but it doesn't really necessarily represent what teachers or students think. Dan, please, then Eileen, please. Uh, two quick things. One is um, I got your joke, Vanessa, and I thought it was funny. So you know, <laughs> our research study, and, yeah. you know, uh, did not everybody laugh? Um, but I was there with you. Um, second She's is sucking up already. Yeah, right. Um, second is uh, so I'm <laughs> uh, Richard made this uh, funny, and I thought. Um, Interesting remark earlier, like, whoa, be the school district that, you know, that oh. went all in on eight track players. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. which is great. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, rectify that at the same time with uh, kind of the fact that there have been transformational advances in technology that have changed schools, right? I mean, so. I don't know when all schools decided to go with chalkboards, but you know, I mean, like that changed the way that schools operated, frankly, and um, you know, textbooks and so on, right? And I, I, so I'm really, a fact, what I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm sure that didn't happen top down. It was like it just at some point there was a tipping point, right? So many districts had them that it just kind of became the way or the norm or what I don't know, whatever it is. This offers you a way to get to that level of information, I think, much more effectively than a small work group does. Uh, so I think it's process. I think it makes a lot of sense. I would also echo John's remarks. I think given the history of this thing, I think it's important to frame it as being about, you know, advancing Good outcomes point. for students um, so that it's clearly that. <laughs> Thank you. I think that makes a lot of sense. And and, and one of those, by the way, is growing up in Brooklyn, New York, uh, I saw the overhead projector in the bowling alleys before I actually saw them <laughs> in the classroom. Yeah. And suddenly the classroom said, hey, that's not a bad idea, the way they're putting strikes and spares, and maybe we'll do that. And then suddenly you had the math guy who always used it, and you, right. you know, whatever. Right. Other, Eileen, please. Well, I don't know how appropriate this is, but I just want you to know that when you start going on Facebook, you never know what you're going to end up with. It, yesterday, mm -hmm. Danny had to make a presentation on the five most popular social networking sites for a project at school. And as he opened up his Facebook account, I saw identified for possible friendship John Austin <laughs> and Lucy Ann Lance. <laughs> a friend of ours is a restaurant owner in San Francisco, a circuit court justice, a judge, and one of my best out-of-state friends. And he's 12. So I can't tell you what you get. But I can tell Watch you out for the creeps on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stay away. I thought I heard that inference too. I was just starting. <laughs> that's a jury. Well, that's well, why then Facebook's then recommending a creep to be <laughs> when this came. <laughs> when this came back to Soup's group the second time, it's why we figured out with these folks actually figured out you don't have to join Facebook. You can go to yeah. the and because there'd be a lot of people that don't want to, number one, or that kids can't, or the access issue from school and all the rest. So we've got other ways to handle that, but still try to get. And one thing we know for sure, it's going to be more inclusive no matter, you know, I hope I'm not building up the hopes too much and we come back a month from now and, and say... We have well, ten friends? Yeah, we have ten friends. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's nothing... They're all the <laughs> yeah. I haven't been able to explain to my brother on this clan that the reason I only have whatever the number of friends are is that's the size of my family, but he still looks at it as, you just have no friends. Of course, that does happen to be true also, uh, <laughs> the longer you're in this job. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of friends over near Saginaw County right now, trust me. <laughs> um, so, other, we, we think that's just a way to get it going and I appreciate the catch, John, and I think that makes sense and, and uh, I think we'll have something of value here and it might inform the way we do our work and um, so good for now. Good? Great. Well, we hope we have at least eight people who like it. Thank you so much. Bobby Joe, our other favorite part of the meeting. I. I'm going to lighten things up by showing you my trip to Washington, D.C. <laughs> oh, I, well, there's a joke in there. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 
So I just uh, returned from Washington a couple weeks ago um, with the National Teachers of the Year. This was our second um, meeting, the first one in Arizona that I shared with you in January. Um, first of all, we had a great welcome with all kinds of gifts from Target. Um, the boss was really awesome when we saw that. Um, <laughs> we rode around that throughout Washington. Um, our first meeting was in the museum. On the very top of the museum, we had a big um, welcome dinner. And why I added the slide in there is the warm welcome from Target is I didn't know how much Target supported education until we were here. But Target has a goal of reaching one billion to support education by 2015. And they donate around $3 million every week to education. And I just wrote some of these initiatives down. The Read With Me, where they're donating over 2 million books to um, high-need families, rebuilding libraries. Take Charge of Education, where they give 1% back to the community um, by using your card in a, t a local Target. And then the Meals for Minds, um, providing those great breakfasts and lunch for students. So I think that's really wonderful and the support that they've given the Teachers of the Year through helping us um, pay and fund for some of these trips. Um, there's our group of educators, we 54 of us. Um, this was a great time there, all meeting again. And I'm going to show you some of the fun things that we did, but we did a lot of educational things as well, especially the networking that you get um, when you have all of us representing our different states and see what was going on in the different states. Um, that night we did take a bus tour around Washington, D.C., a night tour of all the monuments. I had an opportunity to take along my significant other Lance on the right and my father on the left. Um, as I mentioned before, my dad was a teacher for 37 years and has been subbing for 10 years. So it's great that he had the opportunity to go on this trip with me. The, one of the first educational things that we did was go to the Smithsonian. And when I was watching what they were telling us at the Smithsonian, is the Smithsonian was saying they needed to reinvent themselves because of the new type of learning, the new type of person, new type of student, um, adding in that technology. So they were seeing a decrease in their numbers and didn't want to just be a museum just full of things that you had to go to Washington to see. So they were adding a whole new campaign and component of technology. And what, if I can show you, oops, it's not on that slide. But they were talking about adding in, I don't know if you know about QR codes, but the QR codes for the kids to scan with information, adding a lot of their um, types of um, different things in their different museums, adding them online and taking photographs of them, 3D photographs as well, so you can access them from your classroom, and just putting all that technology online. The different educators got to go to different Smithsonian's based on um, your interest, and mine was to go into the Natural History Museum, so it was really exciting when we got to go in through the attic door of that nobody else could be allowed into. It's kind of like a dream where you get to go behind the scenes in a museum and you get to go upstairs where they keep everything and find how they decide what goes out onto the floor, how they do research behind the specimens, um, what kind of specimens they keep, and how they're photographing them, adding a database and research that they're going to add for that technology component so classroom teachers can u utilize this without having to go to Washington. Um, here's some more, just looking at some of the skulls, looking at some of the taxidermy that they do behind the scenes. And then they were developing a new um, component to, to the Natural History Museum where it was a hands-on. So they're going to have this new part, it hasn't opened yet, and the students will be able to go in there and actually take out these items, take out these fossils, and they're going to have different lesson plans and different um, types of technology things. There's going to be iPads all throughout there where they can do research on them as well. And one of the things that we did that was really exciting is the Smithsonian had different projects such as the two below, and they asked us educators what we thought of the projects, how we can make these projects better. So when the students came in and worked on these, um, kind of worked out some of the bugs and as well as putting some of these online for teachers to use at home or, or in their classroom. So that was really fun to help um, find ways to make these projects better. 
And what I just talked about a second ago with the technology, one of the things that Smithsonian is doing is using game technology, which is kind of a forward thinking with um, teachers in their classrooms. So they have badges, so the students can do quests online and they earn different badges. So it's similar to like a Girl Scout or Boy Scouts and you have their badges, but they're learning, or earning them online through different sites and different activities that they do. And so this isn't something that you have to go to the Smithsonian Washington for, but something um, students can do in their classroom as research and more of that project-based learning that gives kids initiative to earn these different badges that, that they try for. So again, I just think that it's not only education that needs to reinvent itself, it's, it's everywhere throughout. You see all the different marketing in different places such as this. So this is John Crom, the, the head of our group, telling us all to behave on our next, <laughs> next part. He was always telling us to be good. And this was where we were going to the vice president's house next. And that's all of us taking pictures of across the street from the vice president's house because we didn't know where we were supposed to be looking. So <laughs> we were all excited and they said, no, it's on the other side of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so this was actually um, Jill Biden was hosting us um, for a small dinner. And she did a talk there, wonderful proponent for educators, had a wonderful talk. Um, it was very exciting to see that she still teaches at college level. When she got done talking to us um, here, she went off to teach her class. And there she is. We all um, had a chance to talk to her individually as well as have a picture with her. Um, just a wonderful person. Um, there's all of us outside with Joe. Another learning opportunity we had was to go to the SMART headquarters where we learned more about the new technologies. Um, such as the teacher that was here earlier talking about the clicker smart technologies. We had a look into those, how you can look at different test questions, find out how many kids missed each question, and be able to um, look across the different subjects as well. And the bottom right, we were playing with one of the new tables. It's like a big iPad table that the students can interact and, and create different types of learning games. So that, that was really exciting to see the new technology out there. We also went to the U.S. Department of Education. We met Arnie Duncan there. And this was their official rollout day for the RESPECT project. And just a couple highlights for the RESPECT project. It's that educators in the United States should be treated as members of a highly regarded profession. That has been their goal for the last year to, in creating this project. And these were seven of the top components. What we did is we got into work groups and we talked with the different pe some different people of, um, at the Department of Education about these different topics and how we could bring these back to our districts and our schools right now, different things that we could start to roll out some of these components. Um, just a couple highlights. Number two, the top talent prepared for success. They were talking about Finland. Finland takes the top 20% of their high school graduates. They encourage them to go into teaching. So you have to be in your top 20% as well as have many interviews. So it's, it's highly regarded. And a lot of other countries like Singapore will make the teaching salaries competitive to the other salaries out there. When the other salaries are increasing, so does the teaching salary to attract um, those type of educators. And number six, the conditions for successful teaching and learning was looking at our um, high need schools, um, high priority schools, and making sure we get um, great principals and great teachers and leaders in those schools to help help bring um, the education of those students equal to the education of the other schools. We had a wonderful gala one evening where we actually all got to dress up with our ballroom um, dress and tuxes. It was just a wonderful reception for everyone. We heard about four or five different speakers. Um, I wish I could have taped them all. I need to find a tape. They were very, very motivational, and I want to show my staff and, and have that out there. One of the um, people that we had a chance to talk to or, or here was the new National Teacher of the Year, who is from Washington State, um, does a lot with the STEM program and physics, um, robotics, um, just excellent representative for us teachers. And then Arnie Duncan down there on the right gave um, another wonderful speech. I also had an opportunity to contact Carl Levin and was given a private tour of the Senate and the House, so that was really exciting over at Congress. I've never been in there. 
Um, we did get a chance to go in to see a session as well where they were talking about the internet and taxes on internet. Um, and there wasn't a lot of people in there. <laughs> I thought it would be pretty full, but there was just, just a couple of senators. And then the highlight of the trip was, of course, to go to the White House for the honor for um, the National Teacher of the Year Award. And this is just us going in there. There's a lot of security checks. That was quite surprising how many times they, they checked your ID. And, and finally going into the east wing of the White House in the bottom right-hand corner. And from that point on, um, we were going in to do some practice over in the um, Rose Garden. So this is the Rose Garden, just practicing lining up. This is before we met the president and um, how we were going to line for the live screening. This is in the Roosevelt Room, and that was the last pictures we could take before they took our cameras. <laughs> so, and if you look at the door in the Roosevelt Room on the right, that was where I first saw President Obama open the door. It goes right to the Oval Office, so that was kind of a breathtaking moment for all of us, and from that point forward, we don't remember a lot, so it wasn't just me. Um, I don't even remember what the Oval Office looked like, so I had to go home and Google it. <laughs> but I thought it was just me, and it was, um, it was everybody. And my students said, when you went through in those checklists, they must have did one of the mind sweeping, like some of the <laughs> <back."> <laughs> So I agreed. I said, that must have been what it was. So we each had an individual picture taken with the president, had a chance to say a few words with him. Um, very warm very friendly, you know, grabbed, gave us a big hug, very um, warm towards teachers. From the Oval Office, we went out and they did the live um, taping from the White House. I don't know if any of you saw it, but he gave a really wonderful um, speech as well as our National Teacher of the Year. And there's all of us afterward. And I'm up there by the right pool. They went according to height, so the shorter people got the bonus of being on the <laughs> And again, I had a chance to take my dad. We could only take one person. Um, so <laughs> he thought it was going to be my significant other. And we said, Dad, you need to get ready and get dressed for going. He's like, well, isn't Lance going? No, Dad, I picked you. You are going to go with me. And, and he got very teary-eyed and excited. and. So it was a really wonderful moment to have somebody that inspired me to go into teaching in this career and for a career that I, I love so much to be there. Um, so that's right in front of the Oval Office. And then the exciting part was when President Obama left, he left out the back through the middle and he had a chance to stop and that was me over there on the right hand side that he's talking to. So my students really thought that was cool and asked what did he say. Well I remember part of it, part of it was he was telling my students tell me to tell my students to do their homework and get their education. <laughs> so and my kids are like, sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have my arrow there for me. There you go. Oh, yeah. So that was me getting off the bus after that, and that kind of sums up my unforgettable journey um, to the White House in Washington. Um, not just the exciting things that I did, but also talking to the educators and sharing all the different um, types of initiatives and things that we're doing in our state. Thank That's you. great. That's <laughs> exciting. You're our national teacher of the year. I don't care what. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> can I move that we keep meeting after three for a little bit longer before Sally party to finish our agenda? Thank you, John. Sorry. Support. There's a motion to support. All in favor, aye. Thank aye. You. All the same. I don't know how we would unmeet the last 17 <laughs> minutes now, but, but thank you for doing that. Legislative update. Marty. Thank you. I'll keep this uh, relatively brief. I did, uh, in the memo that was attached to the agenda, um, it said that the House of Representatives, the House Education Committee did report out a, a couple of bills related to the Michigan Merit Curriculum, and uh, there are some um, obviously significant changes to what the curriculum is now um, and it, it represents from our point of view a watering down of the of the curriculum so um, we are still in opposition to it uh, we understand that or anticipate that the bills will move on the house floor this week uh, for a vote so um, we can expect that to happen their future in the Senate um, is uncertain 
the chairman of the uh, Senate Education Committee has some serious concerns about the bills, the Michigan Mayor Curriculum bills. Um, he thinks, in what I've read in news reports, is that he thinks that the Algebra II, he's, that the Michigan Mayor Curriculum is working now, no need to change it. So that's where that stands right now, anticipating that those bills will move out of the House this week. Um, and of course, you, you know, you had an idea of what the, um, uh, what, the, what they've done so far on the, on the budget. Um, both houses have passed their own budgets, and they're and they're still waiting to take those up in the in the, in the other bud in the other house. Um, and John Cassandra, thank you so much for highlighting that in such an appropriate way, and it got the message. We really appreciate yeah. you doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. The Senate Education Committee really isn't. Uh, they they did they, they did report out a couple of bills that deal with um, greater transparency from school officials and how they're reimbursed and also a House bill that has moved to help um, isolated instances where inclement weather has um, gone beyond the allowable um, schools being, uh, being able to um, get count, count for the days for snow. So that bill is also moving through the Senate too. So um, that will be no doubt moved quickly. And uh, that's really that's, that's what the report I have. I understand. I'll, I'll throw it over to the um, legislative committee uh, chairwoman. Um, thank you. So, I, yeah, the legislative committee um, meets once a month. In the last couple of months, we've been um, entering into some discussions. And earlier today, we had a great conversation about public education budgets, and I think it highlighted uh, the good stewardship, financial <coughs> stewardship of public dollars that directly impacts students is very important at every school in this state. Um, and one growing area of uh, public education is charter schools. We currently have about 275 charter schools and I believe there's about 30 that are slated to open next year if I'm, I'm not mistaken about that. Um, and so in the spirit of good stewardship, the Legislative Committee has been discussing two resolutions related to charter schools and if Marianne, if you want to hand those uh, I'm sorry, Merce, if you want to hand that, uh, both of those out. Awesome, thank you. I thought there's, there's two distinctive issues here, and so I thought um, if we could take uh, one at a time and kind of talk through them. Uh, these are for um, the, the consideration of the full board. <coughs> And I, and I will be um, uh, up front and say that there's not um, agreement among all of the members of the Legislative Committee, so this is something that I know we're going to have a lot of discussion on today and welcome any uh, input, suggestions, um, and I do understand that uh, the chances of there being a unanimous vote are probably pretty slim, but I do want us to be able to discuss these, these items and if we can come to an agreement, great. Um, but, you know, it's, it's for the consideration of the full board. So the first one that we can look at uh, is the two-pager one, and at the top it says Charter School Oversight, May 8, 2013. Uh, in order to create a new charter school in the state of Michigan, an application must be made to the Department of Education. Once an application has been received by the department, the department has 30 days to issue a district code to the charter school, which allows them to begin to collect state and federal funds. The legislature has identified a number of documents that must be included in an application for a new public school academy. Uh, the Department of Education has begun receiving applications that they deem to be um, potentially incomplete or uh, maybe missing some of the documents that are required, but as of right now, the department does not have the authority to withhold that district code if they think that an application is either non-compliant or incomplete. So this first statement uh, addresses 
this particular issue um, and request the legislature to address this by making certain changes to MCL 380.507. And I will read the uh, paragraph that precedes this and then um, there are a number of recommended changes to the actual legislation um, that we've included. So the paragraph reads, the State Board of Education recognizes that the Michigan Department of Education does not have the statutory ability to ensure that public school academy contracts are complete and compliant. While the department has worked intently to make sure that state and federal laws are complied with by conducting reviews on every new PSA contract, it lacks the ability to require contracts to be complete and compliant with state and or federal law. Even though authorizers have been informed as to what a contract must contain, incomplete and statutorily non-compliant contracts have been submitted to the department on several occasions. In order to prevent such contracts from continuing to be submitted, the State Board of Education respectfully requests that the following statutory language changes be considered to the Revised School Code 380.507, and I, I'm sorry I said that with MCL and that's not correct. So basically what this does is add a, adds um, some language to uh, Michigan School Code indicating that um, the copies of the applications must be complete and that complies with all state and federal requirements and then indicates that upon receipt of a copy of a contract, the department will initiate a technical compliance review that serves to ensure that contract includes all required components as set forth within this act. Once all compliance issues are addressed, the department has 30 days with which to issue a district code. Uh, and goes on to indicate um, in another section, a public school academy that continues to be identified as among the lowest 5% achieving of all public schools for two consecutive years after reconstitution will be subject to mandatory contract termination under subsection 5. So this is the um, proposed resolution dealing with charter school oversight. Uh, are there, uh, I, I would recommend we open this one up for discussion first and then we can move to the second one. Yeah, um, I don't know if you're open to. Uh, do I? Is there a mo do we motion make a motion uh, first, and then discuss it? Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, I move that we adopt this resolution. Second. Now we can. Uh, my my suggestion was perhaps to share the the nature of the second resolution as well, and then for, perhaps we could talk together about the nature of the issues here that we're trying to treat. I mean, I, I do feel that there are significant issues that we should ask for legislative action on around um, uh, transparency, around fulsomeness of reporting, and around how to um, provide appropriate um, remedies for real conflicts of interest. I, I, my sense is, you know, as you hinted, that um, we're probably not going to get to a shared uh, uh, approval of recommendations today, but I think it's really important that we begin to um, name these issues and, and have a process for further developing a set of recommendations that are real, you know, and, and that it's very healthy for us to put these things on the table and then perhaps discuss a process by which we improve upon them even. I mean, that's just my sense. Um, if that's the will of the board, that's fine with me. So you're saying, yeah, but now we have a, a, a motion. We do have on a motion table. on the floor. <coughs> Unless you want to you withdraw know, your motion. We've been talking about this for a long time. We've been trying to get this, these amendments of the provisions taken care of over a period of years. And I think we should keep trying. <laughs> I think this is not a new idea in this first resolution. By so all means, let's go ahead with the first one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lupe had a motion. It was seconded by Kathleen. So now we're at discussion. Discussion. Any further discussion? Dan, please. Um, three quick questions. Uh, and I apologize. I've uh, largely been absent from uh, this conversation. Um, so I take it that the department has a position on this, on this uh, resolution. Um, on the uh, the oversight, the two-pager, um, 
and maybe not. If not, then you can correct my misunderstanding. But would love to hear back on that one. Two is um, just some quick examples, uh, so I have some sense of what kind of non-compliant, what the what what kind of incompletions exist, and so on. And then third, what the impact of those kinds of Marty incompletions are. There have been instances where um, our public school academy office has been trying to process the contracts and because the the law strictly says that within 30 days of receiving a contract um, a school code number uh, must be issued um, the public school academy office feels a little hamstrung by not being able to enforce what is required uh, within the 30 days before they you know are, are forced by law to provide a school code number so the the office has um, kind of expressed that concern that that they are giving out a school code number uh, without all of the um, I's dotted and T's crossed um, and all of the statutorily required um, items that must be in a contract. And just so I have some edification, just uh, educate me. What kinds of items? I'll, I'll defer to, to uh, Linda Forward, who is the uh, director in that office. Some of the things, and I didn't bring a list with me, but some of the things would include simple no address for the building because the authorizer has not yet determined with the company uh, with the, the group where the building would be located. And that seems like a simple thing to the point of view of why do we need it or why don't you have it? We can't process state aid at that depth without that address. So we want to make sure that all of the pieces are in place. There are pieces that are required in order to have state uh, in order to get federal grants put in place. And so having all of those pieces in place, knowing what the educational plan is, knowing who the members of the board are. Um, are all pieces that are required and um, so we just would like to have that information in place and in truth what our group is looking for is making sure that everything is placed in place so that the school gets off to a smooth start. Um, we're not really interested in checking the I's and the T's for, for the sake of doing that but rather it's everything in place within the system. Eileen, please. So in researching this with uh, charters, uh, I remember talking to Way, uh, the Widening Advancement for Youth uh, Charter School that's over in Detroit, and they were uh, finding themselves in competition for every available building in the area that they were pursuing. So they knew that in order to get the school started on a certain timetable, they had to go ahead and initiate their application with MDE. At the same time, they had not been able to secure the lease. So they knew that if they listed the the name the uh, uh, the, the property um, without getting things uh, signed up, uh, that they might lose the building, which of course would negate their application because then they wouldn't have a facility. Um, and they also knew that if they didn't go ahead and file the application, that they couldn't start in the fall because they, it was that close. So there are those issues. In the past, when we talked about this, it seemed as if the uh, building was the most common emission, that, that that issue exists for others. It weighs the only one I've actually talked to personally. Uh, so that's an issue. Uh, in, in both of these, th this certainly would make it cleaner for the department. Uh, there's no question about that. But in all the discussions that I've heard in the Legislative Committee, the thing that strikes me the most is, is the, for example, you use the word of excessive, and I know that that's an um, emotional and a quantifying word for you. It, we can't quantify it. The, the department can't quantify excessive. We're not in the policing business for leases. But the biggest issue is that there's never, in the original legislation, there has never been any, been any, any mechanism, like bonds or anything else that exists local millages, for charter schools to be able to uh, modify their buildings. And the leases always, always reflect that. So there's that issue, trying to figure out uh, how is the department going to go in and police a situation in which uh, they may have taken a ramshackle building because it was located in the very area where the students needed to walk to the school. How do you, how do you say that actually modifying that building and bringing it up to code, it, it, you know, if it costs a lot of money, was excessive? The answer is it's not. But for us, when you do this, it would look that way. So I, I, I've said several times that I felt that this was more political than administrative or departmental. And I think we have to be very careful as we approach this to make sure that others on the outside say to us when you list things like excessive or you know, rampant or anything else, that it's really meant to try to compare apples and kumquats and it can't be done. Um, so I can't vote for either of these. I did ask that before we went to this stage that they should be submitted 
to all of the people, all the interested parties, not just the educational reformers who have asked for these kinds of changes, but to the authorizers, to Michigan Virtual, to anybody who could be impacted by this in the future, to get their input so that we really could listen to the charter school community. And we've chosen to not do that route. I'm now asking you to table this and to send it out to everybody openly instead of the emails that John sent out, the emails that Richard sent out, so that we can be transparent on this and get it and get feedback. John, please. <coughs> and just to, to try to keep things clean or separated, I think some of what you were alluding to in terms of building leases excessive are, are set of issues around the transparency paper. Um, you know, this, this document about oversight, if I understand it right, is seemingly reasonably straightforward demanding or requesting help in making sure that charters are compliant as all other public schools are with full information as required by federal law. And uh, there may be some deeper issues buried in that about are we not getting information that we need about civil rights or special education or something else that I'm just imagining, but that we should. And that we should, and I believe these recommendations were informed by the department's sense of what would be helpful amendments. So I certainly am comfortable that this type of thing is uh, likely worthy of support. It's pretty straightforward and modest. I, 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 I disagree with Eileen, but I agree that there's a whole, as I named, there's a whole family of additional issues around transparency around um, ability to um, uh, make the changes if there's uh, or police charters effectively there's a whole additional set of issues that we need to figure out how to take up and address and, and this was beginning to in that direction and I think we should continue that discussion but um, I see no problem with this stuff well if I may I add this one cites the complete contract which this one is asking for revision to so you, you know, there is no complete contract right now because you're saying that they're that they don't exist most of the time. I believe that Linda, from what you're saying, there's enough incidents. How often does an incomplete contract come in? More often than not. Maybe. So more than half. Yes. Okay. So then that then what you're saying is that until this is changed, this wording of complete doesn't apply. So this document can't work. I, I don't understand what you mean by that. <laughs> Well, they're, they're, they're asking there the legislature to do something. We haven't done it for them, so I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, the uh, was this the wrong document? No, this is the right one. Um, uh, okay, hang on. Let me just look at it again. Okay, this is a charter lease one. I'm sorry, sweet contracts. Okay, uh, okay. Give me a few minutes to take a look at it again. When I read it before, I didn't see how I could do it. So, Dan, if I may, kind of to your earlier question, in addition to what Marty said, I, I think where we've struggled with this in the department is, for instance, I, with no malice, I think we were exceeding our legal authority for a while, and we certainly don't want to be doing that. Are we in favor of some more legal authority in some areas? I think that's to be discussed by the board, and, and we... Uh, we're going to implement the law as it ends up, no matter what happens here. I think it's worthy of a thoughtful discussion. Timing would certainly I'd defer to the board on that, as John and Eileen are kind of saying. Uh, but I see ultimately, I think where we're headed as a department is accountability based on student learning and less concern about regulations for everyone. Now, that doesn't mean. <laughs> We don't want to have suggestions about what appropriate things there would be that could, could maybe not be there in the, in the charter world right now. But I'm, I'm just trying to say something a little different, which is from our point of view, we, don't want to, we want to do what you think we should do as a board and hopefully get whatever that is through legislation and then implement it that way, but not exceed it. I think where we've been criticized by the authorizers and to some degree correctly is we were kind of exceeding what the law allows us to do. Um, because so? we have yeah, conscientious. Yeah, just explain that. I'm sorry. I just want to understand. Well, I need mean, so to help me with doing? that. Yeah. It's so um, we, it says in the law right now that within 30 days we must send out the school code number through a letter from Mike. And so our staff would not start the count date counting of those 30 days until we had a complete contract and all of the pieces, which you see here, included in it. And 
that truly is exceeding our, our authority. That's not what it says in the law. And so going forward, as we receive the, uh, the information from the authorizer, we're sending the letter on up to Mike, and then we'll work with the authorizer to the degree that, that we can together all the information. And having said that, it's not that we, we wouldn't support the idea that we have a complete one with some of the flexibility that Eileen's putting there. I mean, sometimes they really can't meet these other timelines based on is it one of these two buildings? We don't know yet. So, I mean, there seems to be some reasonable discussion there. Um, but I, I also, you know, I, I just say this. I'm sensitive because um, with no malice, one of my predecessors pretty overtly, you know, just said wouldn't put numbers on it. That I don't remember if it went to court or where it was, but it, it became it became an issue for the department and for the board as if we were doing everything we could to block. I don't think that was necessarily the intent. But that's the sensitivity here is we should do what the law allows, not exceed it. We would be fully supportive of whatever the board thinks is appropriate to move forward to try to get legislative changes and and uh, and, and but ultimately see ourselves as you know, where are you on the top to bottom list? Are you a, are, are you a, are you a, a, a bottom five percent? Do you, what's your plan to, to move from that? As Deb and her team work with both charters and traditional public, I mean that 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 should be, even the board. I know it's been, um, I don't want to say contaminated. It's been it, it's been changed from when we first talked about the NEs a little bit because of some other discussions about the NEs, but. If we go back to kind of where we were on it, it was thinking that there should be more flexibility for schools in general since they have so much accountability. And then our role is to kind of hold them to that accountability and make sure they're moving. There, there are, though, I think a set of legitimate um, non-educational outcome yes. issues I would agree that need treatment in this domain, um, including, you know, as I understand it, currently it is ambiguous and charters are not providing uh, fulsome information as fulsome as uh, would be expected for other schools to comply with federal and state uh, information right. gathering requirements and they're not forthcoming and what this this document is saying is uh, clarifying that clearly you have to share the information as anybody else would um, there is a different set of issues around whether taxpayer dollars are being abused um, that historically, for example, in our last charter school report, there were recommendations from this body, board, and department saying, please give the superintendent authority to um, withhold a school code if there are clear evidences of um, self-dealing um, conflicts of interest that the authorizer was choosing to ignore in a charter school. And that would, I think, be helpful. Or we could ask for it to give the state board the authority uh, to do something significant to prevent that. I mean, we can ask for whatever helpful. we want, right? But uh, you know, in some, in many cases, you wanted the authority, the superintendent, to do these things. And I think, in the there are, there are a set of those issues that we need to um, be more proactive in making uh, clear that we need legislative change in order to prevent some of this behavior. Uh, and where that responsibility should reside, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. The worst of all worlds, and I know it's brought up once in a while, is this under the current, I'm, I'd be happy to have it <laughs> the state board, but under the current with the state superintendent right. as authority, but there's no clarity about under what kind of conditions. So it would be exceeding, I think, the real authority just to say there's an authority. So I'm going to go to you know, uh, uh, Central Michigan and say that we're taking away your ability to authorize based on what. So the more there can be clarity to that, that's helpful. And I do think, I'm not just trying to offload this given, but there may be something to be said for a board role in that as opposed to a state superintendent role, if we're looking for a revision anyway. Dan, please. Just two other and quick Eileen. questions then. So uh, I don't want to get you in trouble, but am I understanding? <laughs> <laughs> right. Am I understanding it right? So you guys have been withholding a school code until you get, until you get a complete contract? So That's you. It's a 30 day clock once we get a complete contract. We wouldn't start the 30 day clock until then. So That's you've already. Not, not recently. No, no, not in the last two or three months. Yeah, we, we, that's the part that I think doing it. it was a legitimate critique that were we exceeding our legal authority. So it'd be great to have clarification on that. But you were doing that in years past? Or, like, when you say you've been doing that, how long? Like Up until we realized that there was some concern about us. And, and we we ended up. It started in 2005, and we stopped it. Once we realized it was concerned, and we checked with the AG and got an opinion that we were exceeding our 
which was in the last two or three weeks or something, apparently. Uh, um, so folks have been, so charter schools have been living with you not providing a school code until 30 days after a contract is complete for all the time up until starting three weeks ago. Is that right? So this really... So the, the Department of Treasury issues the code if the department does not. Sure, a temporary code, right? I mean, so that's been working for all this time until now. I guess the question is, so why stop? Well, the AG just thinks that it supports the criticism of us that we were exceeding our authority. So we want the authority clear before we continue, that's all. It's, it's kind of one of those things you don't... The treasurer, the treasurer issues it if we don't. That's, right. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So that's what, right? Yeah. So I mean, you know, technically they could have. I don't know that any of this was malice in any place here, or even from people who were applying for it until this was brought to our attention. But I do think that ultimately it was, you know, had folks had we had we been stubborn about this beyond our authority and kept that way, then you go to Treasury and Treasury has the authority to issue it. So I, all this should be clarified so that we're not. I think it was an issue of interpretation of when a contract or an application yeah. is an application. You know, is it an application until it's complete, or is it an application when it's handed in? I think maybe that was some some you know some interpretation issues in our office of public school academies. I have a question, couple of questions. Michelle, please, yes. So if there's a violation of federal law or state law, let's say they buy this building filled with asbestos, or I don't know, some sort of violation is, in, in but yet. The state has given money to uh, to this entity, and who's liable for that? Would the state have any liability in this, or no? Because they author they automatically defaulted and authorized them. Could somebody then sue the state at some point? I, I actually have expertise in this okay. area. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 no, there are things about me that I continually reveal, but I am probably the only person here who spent seven years cleaning up a scrapyard and changing into a nonprofit office That's center. And it was room. seven years because of the uh, the EPA and the DNR. So I can tell you that in the chain of uh, the DNR said after it was all over with, it was the first time that they had ever considered a landowner to not be a perp, a principal <laughs> responsible party because we just bought it and we were renovating it into a nonprofit office center. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, the, the, the government, I had a ton of grants from the state and there was never a point at which the state was considered to be liable. It was the bodies in control. So uh, if that they bought, you? that was me, yeah. Um, <laughs> did, the state, did the state uh, somehow get involved with the process of approving a sale to you and have school children come there? No, no, <laughs> you know, they, they, there are, there are you know, part of this process, Michelle, is inspections. Okay, right. not part of mine, but, but inspections. So you would have a building inspected before you bought it or before you leased it. And so the scenario that well, you how do we know if, the, if it's not complete, if the contract is not complete and we can't prove that that was done? I think one of the things we need to be very clear about is that once a school code is issued, right. just like for several buildings in the traditional sector that we do every year, uh, the responsibility transfers to that board and to that school to continue. And so. We are frequently issuing new school codes for other buildings in the traditional sector, and the same kind of thing can okay. apply. And so the responsibility is strictly that of the, of the local board at that point, the charter so board or the local school board. And it's up to them to take care of all the responsibilities. So, so you know, the Treasury agreed to give funding to students to go into this building. There's no Just like with any other building. They become, a, they become a public school just like any other school once that school code is issued. And so, uh, then, yeah. So they were responsible. They're responsible, and, and and then we have the ability to oversee that through our top to bottom list or other kinds of things. That's the so there are rules in place for all the different schools, and that includes the church. Mm -hmm. Eileen, please, John. So um, uh, the complete contract, it, it, I think, because no, most non no, most nonprofits are going to struggle to sign a significant lease if they don't know they have a school code. In other words, if they are not assured that they can move forward, then they're not going to sign it, and then it's not going to be complete, and here we go again. So what I would say is I would like to have some conversation with the authorizers about whether the word complete works for them, okay? Because we have many good charter schools. So we're, you know, if we're setting up a system that is going to not work for good charter schools that will produce health outcomes for children, it's counterproductive in this document. 
the, I would like to have the authorizer's comment on whether or not uh, the receipt of the contract, this part seems okay to me because I'm neither an attorney nor a charter school person, but I would like to have them come on in case I've missed something. Then on the second page, uh, the, this the prescriptive remedies for failure. Um, I remember conversations in times past about what it's like to open up a charter school, say the, Ga the Jalen Rose Charter School, that location, where I, uh, is Jalen a middle school or a Jalen Rose? A high school. High school. So, kids, it's like the Henry Ford Academy, and John, you're very familiar with that institution as am I, who routinely gets kids reading at a third grade level in ninth grade. So if a school is starting up and has all of the, um, the turmoil of a new school, just getting used to the building, setting everything else up, is, is three years an adequate amount of time for a building to start producing the kinds of results, perhaps in um, uh, surpassing those in the area around them? Because that's the other point of this. I don't see any parallel prescriptive remedies for traditional public schools, and I think that that's the piece that's missing that for me is the kicker on this. Mm -hmm. What are we requiring for the schools around these folks? Are we gonna close them too? Because if we can, and then we should. It's the same thing I was talking about this morning. We have 15 schools right now in the EIA that have been reconstituted. And maybe there'll be 50, but if there's not, what do we do with the other up to 200, up to 500 schools that aren't achieving well? I agree completely that we don't wanna open any more bad <coughs> schools, but to try and come up with time periods that may not fit with the dynamics of the situation when we want to have good charter schools. Why, why, they won't open if they're going to fail during that time period. Let's talk to them and see what's realistic. Why are we not doing that? Thanks. On, on uh, this point, are these, the language on the second page dealing with the accountability kick-ins, are those um, to place charters similarly in the accountability framework as all other schools? Is, uh, is that the intent of this, or is this to do something special with charters here? Because um, I, I, I imagine, I may be wrong, that this was language that the department and others were suggesting in order to place charters into the top to bottom accountability EAA framework consistently with others, or is it something different? Marty. I think it reflects a concern that when a, as any school, be it a traditional or a PSA, gets to that point on the top to bottom list, on the bottom 5%, that there is a, um, a concern that the school may reorganize and um, become, a, become a new school. So I think, part of the, I think the, the genesis of the language on the second page is to... Oh. And do we have, have we seen examples of that? I, I personally don't know the answer to that question. With Turner? Deb, do you? Mm -hmm. With, with, uh, Traditional and, and charter, actually, when you get... So what you're suggesting is there is a opportunity, perhaps unique to charters, it's sort of like, um, what's the, the pharmaceutical industry with, with your patents? You, you could refresh your patents. In this case, you could sort of re, refresh your school to avoid sanctions. Now, clearly, if any of that has happened, or is contemplated by charters that a public school traditional could not ever get away with, then this is, you know, this is something worthy of unique treatment, in my view. Wow. Linda's looking to yeah. I'm sorry. help clarify. No, Linda's, <laughs> Linda's, <laughs> Linda's looking to clarify that. Just, uh, we do have examples where traditional schools have opted, once they're on that list in that situation, to move themselves into a charter situation. So that has happened. I'm not aware of it. I have to go look at the list to see if we've had any charters that have tried to we had one example um, where an authorizer was closing a charter that was on the bottom 5% list, and the charter was then looking for another authorizer. They did not succeed. And there are instances I know, I may refer to Vanessa or Joseph over here, is that there are schools that will reconfigure their grade levels even. And these are traditional schools, you know. So there, there are some, the some maneuvering school. within so. the school systems. Um, to adjust thinking, I guess. Oh, I would certainly defer. Kathleen, please. I have a question about the wording of that paragraph uh, five, section five, I guess, where it refers to uh, for, the, for the three years in a row has, has defined for the purposes of the federal incentive grant created under section seven. I assume that that has a limit of three years. In the federal grant, is that correct? In the federal grant requirements? Is that why the three years is in there? 
this citation in the legislation, uh, we probably better double check it because 14005 and 14006 do not establish any grant. And it was used inadvisably by the legislature when they put in some other language in another bill, and I suspect it's just a little close. So we want to double check that before we vote. Okay, because that's what I thought that. that I thought that's what it referred to for three years. So it was something in the it's, it's a bad citation and it's it's something the legislature's put in and we probably this is an opportunity for us to clean some of that up. I would defer obviously to Cassandra on this, but just a thought I is part of this is in, in order to get some changes that the board ends up believing is necessary, I think there's a good discussion ongoing and can continue, as John said in the beginning. The reality, I think, is that given the current makeup of the legislature that has, you know, seen fit to, for instance, expand the number of charters and other things like that, would we not want to be in a position kind of that Eileen's describing to give some others an opportunity on this come back in June. I'm deferring again. I, I may be missing a, something here. but And then that could give greater ammunition to actually get the changes done, I think. That's one thought. And then the second thought is it sounds like we may have to mm -hmm. make sure we're right on a few <laughs> of these things anyway. And this is all in good faith. I mean, we're, we're learning together here, but it's, it's not as if this is going to be taken up. So I, I sure. would defer certainly to you. But I... I am fine with that, but I would like to have a conversation about the other one as well. Yeah. However, we do have a motion on the floor, so uh, yes. could you withdraw your motion, or how does that work? Um, where's my Roberts now? <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if the want? sponsor is willing to withdraw, that's all that needs to be done. If not, yeah. then we either vote on the motion or vote to table. Uh, all right. So is the sponsor willing I'm to withdraw? I'm the sponsor. What you wish. I didn't hear what you said, Virginia. Sir. You can take one. You can you can withdraw, and then we can move on. If you're not willing to withdraw, then the body has to either vote the motion up or down, or it can modify it in some way or table it. I think it's healthy to table it. Uh, <laughs> there's continuing interest in this. Um, but I also agree. Uh, just very. I, I think it's it's we shouldn't be shy as a board in arguing for both changes and um, changes that we want to see and when mistakes were made in terms of the legislature. For example, it was a mistake, in my view, to uh, lift the cap without quality control, et cetera. So we should be clear in terms of our advocacy there. But if, if, if this our oversight document is not absolutely sure that it's about um, asking charters to produce information a la all other school districts and or putting them in accountability matrix that either solves a unique problem to charters or uh, treats them just like everybody else, then we should <coughs> definitely wait. And I think we should name some of the issues in the other document, but then be committed to, to further develop and circulate, you know, all of this as we move ahead. So is, the, is that a tabling issue then mm -hmm. as opposed to a withdrawing? These things can be investigated further and make sure that they're what we're talking about. <laughs> Does what we want it to do. That sound right. Well, I, I think you know, a lot of thought has gone into this proposal. Clearly. And I, I feel comfortable with my motion. Okay. Well then, I think, why don't we proceed with the vote up or down? Um, I think with that on that basis, because that's the way, that's our only option at this point, without it being withdrawn. Or table. Right? Someone could table. move to table. Yeah, we could be move tabled. to table it, and then. But so okay. far, no one has done. I move to table it. John has moved to support. support. Table supported by Dan. All in favor, aye. 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 All the same. I don't think you can do it. You have to have discussion about tabling, right? No, okay. I don't think you can. I don't think you can no. Override my. No. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think we can. <laughs> I don't think you can. Yeah, I believe so. I think we've done that. We haven't done it in Well, a maybe while. you've done it, but I don't think they <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes sense. I, I mean, Lupe, you get the, the sense history. of where everybody is. I, I, I think the legitimately, I agree. If this was sort of straightforward, ready to go, I would. I will support it. I think there's still a couple issues of whether it's, 
it's uh, hitting its mark yet exactly well, that we should just be sure about. Until the next meeting, yeah. so we don't take it indefinitely. Forever, right. right? With the understanding that I thought that was, I thought that was should, what yeah. I was voting for, but okay. so uh, people will take it back to whoever they want to check, motion. like the charter schools, wherever they want to check with it. Yes, like but, I mean, if you want to get feedback, just mm -hmm. take it to them, and then we can come back and have. What do you think? Sorry. I'm fine with that. Okay. 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 Then, 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 then I would throw my motion and 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 and, and well substitute my motion with that this document is uh, is studied further, but that we vote on it at the next meeting. And you're placing a package in the next meeting. Yes. So there's a motion to that effect because the others are Support. withdrawn. Supported by Dan. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Aye. You're Which one? It? Which one? Opposed or okay. abstaining? Opposed. <laughs> You're opposed to? Tabling it? Assigning it to June. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Well, it is true. Yeah. Sorry. You may not come back in time, so then we'd be voting on it anyway. So. One way or the other, we're bringing it back in June, but it might be based on, and then that would be for the board's prerogative to, right, right. to officially. Yeah. But get this has it. been sent to us for a long time, and if this is a concern that that we had, we should have taken it to the proper or the people that we are having problems with and didn't see it, because it has been out there for a while. Mm -hmm. So now we have another month to take it and I think that's enough time because we have been modeling with this for a while. It's a fair critique and I, I take my my uh, my lumps from my colleague well just because I so just as I have not done any homework on this it went to the legislative committee and so I didn't pay any attention to it. No, there's no, the leadership I, you can trust. I, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then yeah. uh, looking at it, I had a couple of questions and raised them, which no, I think I'm entitled to do, and I just can't get can. my hands around it entirely right now. Yep. My apologies for not having done some homework on it, but I will One more engage in um, in conversation about it between today and June so that I can get fully abreast of it. Thank you, Dan. I well, you know, the only thing that I would add is that the intent here is to get other uh, input. So that, that may require more discussion and not necessarily the board meeting. When is our legislative committee meeting? That is... Marty. Next meeting. Or it's before the uh, retreat. Before, before the retreat? Okay. Before so there's the no time to get the... Uh, we, uh, the question is, yeah. does the legislative committee want 20. to be able to weigh uh, what the responses are before the board meets? Changing the legislative committee might give us that option. Changing the meeting next week too. Well, we already voted on it. Well, we can discuss that after May, the May yeah, 20. Yeah. At the retreat too, can't we? I'm just trying to give us the best possible timetable for what we just said we wanted to do, which was to get feedback. Mm -hmm. So let me be, or Marty, why don't you help us get clarity on what's expected of us before that time? Okay. No, I mean, why don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you, oh, you don't have to tell us now. <laughs> May 20th is the next legislative. So you, what, do you, what do you ask you me now? You don't have a month. You okay. have a minute. Let me start <laughs> over. To, to reach I'm out. going to try to get clarity on. So the expectation would be that we would invite input from which groups? in order to get the date that you're concerned uh, about, I mean. Well, uh, for me, it would be the... Is that your concern, Cassandra? Since we clearly want to impact the cyber yeah, schools, it would be good, good to hear their voice. Uh, Michigan yeah, Virtual, uh, the authorizers, Central Michigan. Um, I, I don't know of any others. Dan, MAPSA, uh, sorry, is there, are there others and that we should be looking at? And, and if we got that out tomorrow, I think in the meeting is... 20th. 20th. Monday. Monday. Dan's Monday. a quick worker. Sorry. I mean, seriously, I think they're familiar with this and would like an opportunity, as you're saying, and I think we could get that feedback and ask them to have that by then. And have, has Ed trusting it? Uh, what, who, which reformers have had, has everybody had access to it yet? Well, not everybody. I, I sent it along to four or five or six entities. I think we should yeah. just be open yeah. and yeah. transparent and just uh, yeah. uh, make sure that everybody who would be wanting to weigh in on this has a chance to talk. So we'll, we'll 
Does that sound right, mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Yes, that is fine. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> you know, this strategy is working because I felt that if we could get past 4 o'clock, we wouldn't be able to have the reception and Sally would have no, to stay, stay for another month. <laughs> <laughs> and wait, now she's shaking her head here. <laughs> okay, so the second um, resolution that you have in front of you is entitled Charter School Transparency Recommendations, May 8, 2013. Uh, and it pertains to financial oversight. Uh, as you know, many Michigan charter schools are managed by for-profit management companies who, in addition to their uh, management company, also have related real estate development companies. Uh, and these development companies own the buildings in which the charter schools reside and lease the space to the charter school. The question is what constraints, if any, exist on the amount in which the charter schools are paying to lease these buildings, and also uh, what is the real authority of the boards to exercise their fiduciary power in negotiating these lease agreements. So this, um, this resolution reads as follows. The State Board of Education is constitutionally charged with general oversight and supervision of public education in Michigan. Charter schools are taxpayer-funded public schools that provide an alternative to traditional public schools and are a growing part of Michigan's public education system. Many Michigan charter schools are managed by for-profit education management organizations, or EMOs. In addition, several charter schools operate in buildings owned by a real estate holding company directly related to the managing EMO and leased to the school for which the EMO oversees the distribution of the school's budget. The uh, State Board of Education is concerned about the potential for abuse that may be caused by this informal relationship between the EMOs and their commercial real estate interests. Specifically, the State Board of Education is concerned about charter school lease agreements that far exceed standard market rate value rates. In addition, the indirect relationship between an EMO serving as both the operator of a school with control over that school's budget, otherwise known as a sweep contract, as well as the landlord, raises questions about a charter school board's ability to fulfill their fiduciary responsibility by influencing and or negotiating lease contracts on behalf of the students they represent. The State Board of Education respectfully requests legislation is created to address the potential for excessive lease agreements between education management companies and their charter school boards, which may result in unusually high profit margins for EMOs and their real estate holding companies at the expense of instruction. Specific legislative recommendations include Charter school lease agreements should reflect market conditions, which may be reflected through standard building appraisals and be subject to negotiation by a charter school board. Provide charter school authorizers with the responsibility and the authority to review and approve lease agreements, as well as the authority to disapprove any lease agreement that may not reflect market conditions. And outlaw the use of sweep contracts for EMOs and their real estate holding companies that own or lease a building in which the school resides. Uh, I will just remind you that last month we did hear from a former uh, charter school board member who indicated that this was a problem when he was a board member that um, they operated in a school that was leased by the leased by the school to the real estate holding company associated with the management company and when they tried to renegotiate that lease they were specifically told that they were not to renegotiate with that board and if they attempted to uh, try to change EMOs uh, the school would be shut down. That raises questions in my mind as to what the potential is for a board to actually exercise its fiduciary power and its oversight uh, responsibilities um, and uh, as well, I can also tell you that I have done a lot of research on this as well. We are not the only state that is looking at this or has looked at it. Um, New York, for instance, found that many of that some of their charters were charging what they called excessive leases to the tune of 800, 000, an additional $800,000 a year, and as a result, have placed a moratorium on for-profit managed companies in their state. Um, so this is not new, uh, it's not something that's specific to Michigan, but it is something that I think we need to address. Dan, please. Um, so this <coughs> one's a lot easier for me. I don't have any questions about it. It's clear. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and I think it's right. I, I would, um, so any, two, two quick thoughts. One is that, um, as Richard said eloquently this morning, uh, any, uh, locally run school system that does a poor job of stewarding its funds um, 
uh, is deserving of reprobation. Um, these are funds that are designed to educate young people, and whether it's a charter school or a traditional district school, if those funds are not being used for that purpose um, or being used largely for some other purpose, um, and so taking away um, uh, some of them that could and should be used for that purpose, um, that's something that as a state we shouldn't allow to have to happen, one. Um, two is, um, hmm, I've forgotten my second point. I'll let it go. I'll come back to it later. Well, while so. you're thinking of it, um, I guess, I, I, A, I am very sympathetic to this resolution and its intent, and I, I guess my recommendation, not just because I have to leave to pick up my daughter after school, but my recommendation is we should um, seek to uh, add on to this or improve on this statement um, and circulate it for additional input with uh, perhaps additional attention to a couple other issues that I think are part of a transparency and then enforcement mechanism. You know, um, The other issue around beyond the lease dealing is the transparency of charters uh, as embedded in charters are for-profit companies who are hiding behind their for-profit status to not reveal information that other school districts would ordinarily mm -hmm. reveal. And I think that's an important element of transparency that needs to be treated as well. Um, and I also think then the question of, okay, where does the authority lie uh, to, um, to sanction charters who are clearly um, uh, conflicts of interest and self-dealing? And that needs to be a recommendation in this kind of uh, resolution as well. So I would encourage us to further develop these recommendations uh, as uh, as part of what we do uh, and uh, get additional input on them. But that's that's just my recommendation. But I think th there's additional pieces here that we want to include. I'm not uh, opposed to this at all. Okay. In favor of it. Eileen yeah. and Richard. Uh, again, you can't uh, you can't do a, a standard building appraisal and have it reflect renovation costs. Now, just for a second, suspend judgment on the on the for-profit people that you're convinced are doing sweeps and everything else. Just think about this for a minute. For a normal, uh, think about way, which went in and had to completely renovate the building. So this language wouldn't allow them to do that. It would say that whatever the lease cost was and the market value of the building space wouldn't reflect what they actually had to do to bring the building up to code for a school, which is different than any other property. So it, 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 there is language here that may work. We don't know what it is, but the authorizers will know, or the, or the charter schools themselves will be able to say, wait, 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 you know, there is a way to calculate this, but this is not inclusive enough to give a real value at least would have to be to start a charter school. So you would agree with John? I absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's well, with the exception that you may not support this, I totally support the... No, I just meant in terms of process, right. though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're scaring me there. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Richard and then I, Michelle, did you... Yeah, I the fact, know. Kathleen, mm -hmm. the I fact is... Richard. Oh, oh uh, you know, sorry, go ahead. The fact is that charter schools do not have the capital funding that traditional public schools have. Furthermore, they are on leases to a maximum of five, maybe six years. So they do not have the borrowing power that traditional public school districts have. So you are naturally going to spend more for credit and capital investment. Now, where does this come from? Well, the firm that has run the schools with the highest uh, pupil achievement in Michigan has been National Heritage Academies. And they are able to do so because they invest capital funds in a building and then recoup those costs through leasing. Um, and again, I want to, you know, they, they run the Canton Academy, which is the highest performing mm -hmm. school, uh, public school in the state of Michigan. Um, so the, uh, the other consideration is, uh, in, and a good example is our, our friend from the board who complained that the, that the majority of the board uh, that he was a part of didn't want to go into another building and leave the management company because apparently they felt the expertise of the management company was more important than getting into another building. That's a perfectly uh, sensible uh, and economic judgment to make. And as, as someone who was unhappy with the, with the majority on, on his board, we can understand he complained to us. Um, 
the I'm, I'm very fascinated if you take a look at this resolution and instead of talking about leasing talk about standard market values for teaching survey what teachers are getting in the private sector compare that with what public school teachers are getting one could argue that traditional public schools are spending children's money on staff costs that could easily be recouped uh, if they paid the, the, mar the prevailing market wage for teaching. So I think that uh, the resolution is, is, is wrong-headed. Uh, charter schools already have an authorizer that they are accountable to in a charter contract. Uh, they have to face some financial matters that have been not that have uh, circumstances that have not been acknowledged in this resolution, and we are attempting to uh, take on more, uh, take on problems that uh, uh, really are quite minor in the big in the big picture of things. Uh, something like this might affect the National Heritage Charter Schools who are delivering good things for children in Michigan. And I think that we need to look at from a perspective of how this affects, how helps or hurts Michigan students and um, not, be, not be preoccupied with rumors of uh, exorbitant costs and, uh, and such. That's really out of our area of expertise and, and I think this resolution is ill-advised. Kathleen and then Michelle. Well, first of all, I don't think we're talking about rumors. I think we're talking about facts uh, based on their budgets and their reports. These are not rumors, to my knowledge. And uh, I have no problem with, with a company recouping its costs, but these companies recoup their costs over and over and over again within a period of three or four years. They like triple, triple recoup their costs, Can, and could, that's, could a, you name that's one? a big profit. I mean, I know they're in business to make money. These schools are in business to make money, the for-profit companies, and that, that's disturbing. I mean, I, were, I know they're going to make a profit. That's what they're in business for. How big a profit is part of the question. Doesn't I think sometimes the profit is excessive, much less the lease agreement. Uh, so it's a matter of judgment, I guess. But I, I, I would be perfectly comfortable dealing with this. I think some of the issues that John raised, we have tried to get, I mean, I, I'm the only one here that goes back this far, I guess, but when we had a 4-4 board, Republican Democratic board, we unanimously <laughs> tried to pass resolutions, and this must be 10, 12 years ago, uh, to get the management companies to be transparent. They insisted that they don't have to give out information because they're private companies. Our position was that they're running public schools and that, that, that they are responsible to the public for any public schools. They should be able to be, should be required to report their information the same as a, regular, a real public school does. So this is not, what he's suggesting is not a new idea, but I don't know if it has to be in this particular resolution. Well, this recommendation is not like so much of us right, to do recommendations. So I'd be happy to support this today, or, or if they if, if consensus us to add more things to it, that's okay too. But I think we should start doing something about this. Right. And educating legislators. There are a lot of new legislators. They don't know all this law right. and how these things operate. So yeah. maybe we could do that. <coughs> Michelle, please. Yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, I support, um, I don't support waiting on this, and I support, I think it's ready for a vote now. Um, and uh, if nothing else, then what, like Kathy said, to bring this to people's attention. And I don't think, you know, maybe people are doing great things with this money and investing it in directly on kids, but the problem to me is, is the, pro with the oversight of the boards, the appointed boards on these schools, the lack of transparency, we don't know. I mean, we can guess, oh, I think they're nice. They, I'm sure they're using them for good things. Oh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't trust them. I'm sure they're just putting it in their pocket. But the pr thing is, we don't know. And, and, they, and there should be 
some sort of fiduciary standards, I think, um, instead of just saying, well, they can do this and we'll just cross our fingers that they're putting it to good use. I don't think that's good oversight standards. I think we have to hold them accountable like we would Detroit and the school board, you know, school system in Detroit. So I, I, I strongly support this and no, I see no need to wait. Is, I, I don't want to encourage or discourage, but is, are we leaning towards a vote? Do we have a motion or do we want a little more discussion? Theoretically, I probably should have said, is there a motion and then discussion first? But how would you like I to that John moved. Um, I thought that John said that he would. I, I actually, he didn't because he was talking about including more, uh, right. more yeah. questions. He just made a recommendation. Right. So, I, I mean, for order purposes, is there a motion and a second? And mm. let's. Order. I move that this be uh, submitted to the same list of people for comment uh, as the previous uh, document. By Eileen, is there support? support? Supported by Richard. Further discussion? Well, if, yeah, go ahead. Dan and then Michelle. Um, I remembered my second point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have another one just uh, based on some stuff that people have said. Um, so maybe I'll do, do them in reverse order. The, in response to stuff that people have said, I, so I'm reading this, and maybe I'm not reading it um, the right way, but when I read, for example, charter school lease, the first bullet, charter school lease agreement should reflect market conditions, which may be reflected through standard building appraisals and be subject to negotiation by a charter school board. I'm reading that to mean should reflect market conditions for a school in this particular environment, wherever it is, right? And so, like, that shouldn't infringe on national heritage's ability to negotiate whatever an appropriate market rate for a school is in that community. So I don't, I'm not sure, I guess I don't understand how it would <coughs> negatively impact their business model or anybody else's business model. Um, Dan, may this I interject? Is a standard real estate appraisal won't get you that number. It won't get you the renovation cost, the inspection cost, all of the... Sure, other, you know, but we're not, not talking about the renovation cost here. We're just talking about the lease agreement. No, the lease That's agreement is what covers that. There's no other mechanism for a charter school. They can't borrow money to cover it. They can't bond. They can't, they can't do any of the things. All right, so, so, here's, so here's the point that I'm trying to get to, yeah. right. which is and that <laughs> whatever would come of this could take all of that into account. I mean, the point is... This isn't directed at the average, like, this is the way you recoup the, co the building costs for the way you school. And I'm familiar with way, good program, and the like. This is designed, it seems to me, to try and address, um, and I don't know whether it's an actual problem at this point in time. I haven't looked at the data and so on, or if it's a potential problem that other states have actually faced and we could potentially face. Either way, it's pretty low risk for us to say, look, if you are abusing this system and taking money out of it that should be going to our kids, that's wrong. Like, that seems to me to be a pretty, like, you know, like, right thing to do. Um, As the kids I, say, a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's not, it's not legislative language, I think, that we're talking about. I mean, so it seems to me to be a much lower barrier kind of uh, uh, risk involved in not having the language exactly right. The point is, if you're abusing the system, <coughs> taking money out of the system that should be going to kids, that's a problem. And to the extent the that this is a... Isn't right. The language is actually wrong. The language says that you cannot right now put in your improvement costs. It says a fair market value for the real estate. That's not the same thing as renovation. <coughs> so, you know, Lansky's only cost us $150,000 to buy. It cost us a million and a half to remediate. So propose, I, what I would suggest then is that you <coughs> propose the language that should go in here. Simply strike whatever, whatever it is, because this is directed at the excessive issue. Exactly. Right? But the problem and is here. that we don't know what that is. We don't have the real estate ex expertise on the right. board to figure it out. So that's why I'm saying give it to the authorizers. They face this all the time. We have a motion. And a, but let, me, uh, let me do this. I'm going I'm to be a CEO for a minute, not as board chair. Sorry. I'd like to... I'd like Sally to leave and, and <laughs> allow, our, <laughs> allow our MDE folks to come upstairs and I just close the doors because I'm not sure how far this is going to go. And most of them, many of them have four o'clock shifts and have left and others have five o'clock shifts and I want them to have an opportunity to interact with Sally. So uh, your last act is we'll be with you in a little <laughs> bit. But, but I, I don't mean, no, this is important what we're doing yeah. here. So I don't want to, but I also want people to be able to come up. So whoever's ready to hit that MDE all email, would you do that? And then just close the doors so they can start interacting with Sally right, and then right, let's do what we're going to do here. I mean, we need to do the right thing here, but so who's um, hitting that? MDO. That was, did, did. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. 
You're on it. Okay. And and uh, close the doors. Not like in secrecy. They can come in if they want, but then we won't hear the. Uh, <laughs> they can watch as though furniture cheated. Yeah. 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 So that was also a tactic to just. <laughs> I'm going to take a deep breath here for a minute. So I've, uh, who was next? I apologize. I was, I was in the you, middle of two points. Middle. Okay, Dan, I hadn't sorry. actually finished making my first one. Um, so, for example, <laughs> all three bullets could be struck, just as an example. And you would, mm -hmm. you would have language that says we're still concerned about the potential for abuse. We're concerned about conflicts of interest. We respectfully request that legislation be created to address the potential for excessive lease agreements. And there, like, it's so... I'm not like I, to me this is not an issue that needs to be sent out to folks and vetted it just I mean if there's like if there's particular language in here Eileen or others that is offensive I just recommend what you do what we always do which is just to strike like say oh you know what that language should come out that just doesn't make sense and here's why or whatever but to the extent that this is concerned about abuses we should all be supportive of this right it, it, as best that I can tell I mean I just I'm not getting that that's one two is um, there is at the same, so part of the challenge here, this is one of those, as John just described, so there are kind of two categories here. Either we're throwing charters in with everybody else and saying you're subject to the same rules, or there are unique situations having to do with charters that require unique legislation, unique response, and so on. This occurs to me as the latter of the two, largely because charters don't have bonding ability, right? So they just don't get to facilities the same way that other schools in the state get to facilities. Um, which is fine, and so there, just to be clear, there are two routes that can be taken here. One is to, or even three routes that could be taken here. One is to create the special language or recommendation to deal with the unique situation that they face, which is they don't have bonding authority, they've got to get to their building some other way, which is what this is an attempt to do. Two is, is to get everybody so that they have act, they get to those buildings the same way, whether that's through a bonding authority, whether that's through a state authority that holds the building and issues performance contracts for everybody. Whatever it is, the point is you put everybody in the same bucket. Um, I guess a new, oh, oh, and the third is something new or different, right? And I don't even know what that would be. It may be worthwhile for us to talk about issue number two. Like, I'm not sure, once again, to this point around the long-term conversation in this state. Long-term, I actually am not sure, I'm not proposing it today, but I'm not sure that it makes sense to have schools in the real estate business at all. I don't know why we do that for school. I don't know why we have traditional districts bond. I don't know why we have charters go through all these hoops. Like, the business here should be educating kids. And the fact that people have to have real estate expertise on their teams, whether they're a traditional district or a charter school, makes no sense to me. It's just backwards. I just don't get it. Um, so for what it's worth, I think there's a, there's a conversation to be had for all of us about the role that real estate plays in education currently and whether it should. I, I think before, I want to get the order right. I know you, we're not going to – was it Richard next? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Um, I know Cassandra is up yeah. too, right? Sorry. Uh, I guess I want to second that, that thought of Dan's. I think that other states provide uh, buildings for charter schools to operate out of and thus allow them to concentrate on an educational vision rather than a, a full business plan. Um, and... Um, and, and because there are, uh, I think there is a, a what am I say, uh, fruitful conversation to be had on these and related issues, I, I think it would be premature to pass this particular resolution. But, but I just want to echo your, your thoughts on that. I've lost track and help me with this. Michelle, Michelle were you up? Kind of and then Cassandra. Thought, what I was going to say, but mm -hmm. I, just, I just want to make, you know, this is... I mean, they were, if, if charter schools were under regular uh, ISDs and school districts, I, a lot of this stuff, I think, would be not an issue. But, um, and I think sometimes we, we we set up these systems and these all these problems, and it was not really, not well thought through. You know, I mean, I wish we could go back in time and say, well, maybe we should not move forward so quickly with all these charter schools and expansions of charter schools because we really haven't thought it out and had all the parties discuss it. I wish the legislature would um, have 
dumb, <laughs> was as thoughtful as we are being over this little resolution right here. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, again, um, I just think, uh, you know, it's, it's this lack of transparency. I think uh, the incentive um, around profit, profiteering off of public funds that um, it's sort of the crux. And, you know, you know, and maybe, you know, if we do put this aside, we should go ahead with what John is suggesting and expand it even further to come up with issues around accessing information um, from schools when they want to act like private companies, uh, make them be, um, be transparent around things of special education and, um, uh, and, and everything. Why, why would they not have to be transparent? And I really think there should be elected boards of some sort. These, these appointed boards are, to me, Sort of I think it was Cassandra and then Lupe. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of the issues that came up. Um, one, I, I completely agree that um, you know charter schools exist and they don't get the same financing that traditional public schools. Absolutely, you know traditional public schools are owned by their local taxpayers. They get to bond. They get millages. Charter schools don't get to do those things, and they're not owned by the local taxpayers. Um, but on, on the other hand, if, if these leases are simply, as you're indicating, um, that they are more of a financing model than they are necessarily a traditional lease, vendor lease, um, at some point they've recouped their money, right? And then if that were the case, then you would expect to see leases start to come down because at that point they're, they've broken even uh, and, and now market rates could take a, an effect. Um, but we're not seeing that. I've gone through many leases and they don't go backwards. They, in fact, one of them that I looked at recently jumped $300,000 in one year. Uh, you know, those are the types of issues I think that we need to be concerned about. Um, and, and to Dan's point, it's not like I said in the beginning, it's not Michigan-centric. Other states have been looking at this. Other states have been dealing with this. Um, and uh, they are looking at market rates. Um, I think when it comes to charter schools, um, from my perspective, I agree, we can't compare them to tr traditional public schools. They don't get the same financing. But they are commercial real estate. And there is a market in commercial real estate. Um, and I don't think it's unfair to suggest that commercial real estate market value is completely out the door when it comes to these. And part of the problem maybe goes to Eileen, the fact that the schools don't have to disclose how much they spend on renovations and things like that. So we don't know and we don't have a way to know how much is spent, which is another transparency issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, because I. I but I don't think it's unrealistic and unacceptable for us to ask questions and to expect answers. Um, I don't think that they are in such a unique position that they can do whatever they want for as long as they want and no one can ever suggest otherwise. Uh, and that's all I'm really trying to get at here. I am fine if we take these recommendations off. I am completely fine with that and just have the language. Um, but I, I do think it's important that this is a public issue and it should be scrutinized and, and at the end of the day all this is is a recommendation to the legislature. There's no guarantee the legislature is going to take it up. Mm -hmm. um, they might not care one way or the other that we're bringing up this issue. But I, I, I still think it's important to be on record to say that we understand there could be an issue here and we think that it would behoove the legislature to maybe look into it. Lupe was next and then Richard. Okay, I would like to call the question. Or a vote. I think the question okay. was not to do it. It was what was the motion? Right. Well, Richard has his hand up, Lupe. So we usually we usually let people do the full discussion. Well, so but parliamentary tricky. procedure, when you call the question, you vote on it, and you and, and if we yeah. and it's undebatable. I think that's debate. Correct. So let's let's Can do that. Can you repeat what the motion is? Sub submitting this res this uh, one pager charter school transparency recommendations to the same list of people for comment. I would like to... It's moved it in. Oh, okay. Can't get anything. Can't okay. any. okay. Let us vote on calling the question. Calling the question is moved by 
Eileen supported by Richard. All in favor, aye. Aye. Um, Opposed, same. Sorry, we okay, no. we're going to call the question that then we vote on the motion. Are the we voting motion. on the calling the question or on the call, motion? Oh, first, we, we vote on calling the question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, I'm sorry. That's that's on me. On so not on the motion. We're not no. voting on the motion. We're voting on whether we call, call the, the question. question. So let's do that. All in favor of calling the question? Aye. 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 Opposed, same. Aye. Aye. Demand say his piece, and then we'll vote. No, but right, we'll come and you vote. Well, I, well, you know, I, that I, I think you had two thirds, so we can go on to the question. So no, okay, I so now <laughs> let's, let's go on to the question. Uh, to this is back to the question now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Aye. aye. Okay, so that motion was defeated. Yeah. Is there a new motion or? Yes. or I move that the uh, proposal be uh, submitted to the legislature as written. Second. Of course, I'm going to vote a no against. So. It's moved by I Eileen. Have to, I have to leave. I should have left about that. <laughs> moved by Eileen, supported I'm by Lupe, to, to take this as written and submit to the legislature. Yes. Um, any further discussion? Just to observe, if, if these leases weren't transparent, then Cassandra would not be able to tell us that uh, one had been raised by 300000 So there is transparency here. Go ahead. I call the question. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, there's no decision. Oh, no, we have to vote on the question. You're about to vote on the I'm ready to vote. I'm ready to vote. There wasn't any further discussion. Was there a second to your motion? Yes, yes there was. Uh, Lupe was the second. Oh, okay. So it was moved. This is actually, I think, in its own way, a good thing. Eileen moved. Lupe supported. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Nay. Nay. So I think it was. It okay. carries. Motion All carries right. to submit this to the legislature as is. Okay. okay. Oh, could I, I'd like to ask Marty a question. <laughs> what you're talking about first. This is the mission merit curriculum. Yes, I'm Do you have a, or does Wednesday have a list of what was actually reported out of committee? What oh. The changes are? Because what I read in Godmore, it seemed to be that it's okay. The changes weren't as. I'm going to refresh my parliament. Well, they were they were uh, um, adjusted, and I thought that we had sent to the board the, the most recent um, uh, summary of them. I, I'll make sure we send them again, though. Oh, could you yep. please? Yep. This is on us, not on you, but I'm looking down at our time estimate, 20 minutes. <laughs> so we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do a better job on that. We being me and the, the <laughs> team here. But hey, this is part of democracy and that's we're right. talking and we're, so, we're right. better than we're talking than punching. Punching, yeah. <laughs> so I think we're moving on to consent agenda. Is that correct? correct. Thanks, Marty. Sure. Kind of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the consent agenda, do I have a motion, please? So moved. Support. Not at this point. <laughs> Next generation. Uh, oh. Moved by me, supported by me. Supported by Dan. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. What, what Allison is doing is reminding me that Sally's uh, thoughtful uh, resolution is buried in there, but since she's not here anyway, I'll do something when we get out there. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, and comments by board members? <laughs> One quick comment, just really quick comment. Two of them aren't even here to say it. I just want to acknowledge John and Eileen and Cassandra for all of their hard work in supporting Common Core through this difficult time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And if, I might just add, because I feel like, feel like I need to, the staff's been the really, really working on this too. So I know you. Yes, ma'am. I want to follow up the discussion we had this morning and say I hope we do set up a committee between the board and, the commi and that committee because I think we really have to concentrate on the, on the whole issue yeah. of how we yeah. think. I think it's a great opportunity. I, I, if they were, they're willing, I mean, we have to follow up on that. John and I yeah. talked about it. I, I think John may need to, uh, well, we'll talk about this, yeah. but I'll, I'll probably, many of us can, but I'll probably prompt John if he wants to I talk directly to Rogers. I've been pushing for years, and I just hope yeah. it 
we actually do it. it, it yeah. It's yeah. a great opportunity to have that because I was trying to say this gently, but we do we do need to have the authority we have, and yet ultimately they've got the vote. So if we could bring this together at the same time. <laughs> the other question I had, is there any thought about meeting with the policy committee, the House Education Committee? Or the uh, the agenda planning can always Yeah, we look can raise that. that at agenda planning. Yeah, because there That's were some members said. who said we, we ought to get together, and I think I, I don't know if the whole committee wants to do it, but the mm -hmm. committee, but yeah. why don't we, um, I, I, see Mertz, I see Mertz copying it down for a potential place to stick it in the, uh, <laughs> stick it the okay. place it in our future <laughs> meetings. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Okay. Yep. Thank and you. <laughs> thank you, Kat. Um, any, any other items? Okay, consider us adjourned and please give your best to Sally as you're